of uh, North Africa. <laughs> it looks exactly like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> close enough. Let me see here. Here is North Africa. Right here. Right here. This is, uh, this is uh, Egypt is a four. This is North Africa. Israel, Turkey, Greece, Italy, France, Spain. Alright. Uh, as you see, the Alexandrian corruptions, or the corruption of the Word of God, started in Alexandria, Egypt of origin, who lived from around 8, 184 to 254. And uh, it always was a hotbed for corruptions and dark old heresies here. Now, the old Latin got corrupted here in about 150 AD. And then around 200 AD, the old Latin corruptions from what Africa came up to Europe, because Latin is originally an African language. And um, when Islam came up, and Muhammad in the 7th century AD, that came from Arabia, but where did they go through as a wildcat through a paperback? Did they come through here, Europe, or did they come through here to Europe? North Africa. North Africa, right. They did not come through here until when? 1453. Here was the Eastern Roman Empire came down. Here. So the Eastern Roman Empire hold against the hordes of the Muslims for about 800 years. This area. Well, this is exactly the area where Paul preached, because his first missionary journey went from Antioch up to here. The second one went up to uh, here and, and here, and the third went up to uh, I think here again. It was Asia Minor, so the west of the present Turkey, and Greece. So that's where most letters were written to or were written from, and they were copied and copied and copied right here. And the language in the Eastern Roman Empire was Greek, it was not Latin. Everybody could read the pure word of God, so the Greek church was the preserver of the pure word of God in the New Testament for uh, 1400 years, and when Constantinople, Byzantium, fell to the Turks, all these manuscripts went from here up over the Balkan to Europe, to Basel, to Heidelberg, to Cambridge and Oxford, where Erasmus, at that time the most famous scholar in Western Europe, was traveling around, collecting these manuscripts, comparing them with the Latin Vulgate, and seeing there was a huge difference, and that's why he made his own New Testament, 1516. And the second edition was used by Martin Luther, the 59th edition, to make Luther's 1522 uh, September Testament, the first German uh, Reformation Bible. So we see the Word of God spread out here, made sure that the Muslims couldn't come through here to Europe. Now, they came through right here, through... Uh, here and here and here, up straight into Spain. Why was that? There was no protection of God from the Word of God. It was all corrupted for three, four hundred years before Muhammad came through there. See there? So the result of rejecting the book was Islam took its place as its final authority. See there? That's what history says. So when right now England, since 1884, has said we are rejecting the authorized version as our final authority, as a state, as a nation, as a family, and in every church, you know what the Muslims say right now? What's their aim? England. England. Why England? Because the book can go on. The book. There is a satanic spirit in these. Uh, dedicated Muslims to their God, Allah, the God, which is the God of the world, as we know, and say so we want to destroy the nation which gave us this book. So as long as England goes on like they do, and reject this book in all the Bible schools and theological seminaries, there's a worst possible translation, all kind of corruptions in it, God says, I'm going to do the same thing with England as what happened here uh, about 1,400 years ago. And here comes again one of Murphy's laws. The only thing which man learned from history is what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. 
Uh, you say, well, it's a little too negative. How can you say that? Well, look at another country, Germany. In Germany, all the uh, German rationalists and, and main Bible uh, lower textual critics came up. Thailand von Gebhardt, uh, Lachmann, Griesbach, uh, Stier, uh, Nessel, Erwin Nessel, Kurt Aland. And they, st they, took, they, they torn up the uh, old Luther Bible before 1850, completely to pieces in all the theological seminaries. So God, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bless Germany with three wars. The 1870 war, they won that one. 1914, 1945. The second 30 year war, after the second 30 year war, Germany was in ruins, split in half, and they lost a few million men, and they've never been independent since 1945. They're under the European Union, back under Rome's authority, ruled through Brussels and Strasbourg. Because of what? One book taken out. Martin Luther said prophetically, just before he died in 1546, he said, uh, the Germans better take heed. The Jews had the pure word of God, but didn't take heed to it. They were kicked out to Babylon and Assyria. The Greeks had the pure word of God for more than 1,400 years. They didn't believe it, practice it, evangelize it, uh, mission minded. The Turks are in there right now. Now the Germans have it. And when the Germans don't take heed to what God has given them, they've been in the same way it will be destroyed as the Jews, as the Greeks, and it was right. He said another thing, the German people are now a blessed nation because they have the word of God in their own language. When that book is taken away, Germany can be the greatest scourge to the earth. You talk about prophecy. He died in 1546. We know that number 40 is an important number. The number 40 is a number of what in the Bible? Yes. Testing. Number 10 is the number of what in the Bible? Gentile, Gentile. Gentile number. 10 times 40 is what? The number of the Gentiles and the number of testing. 400 plus 50 and 46 is 1945, 1946. They had 400 years after Martin Luther's death. The book we use, the Luther Bible we use, is the 1545 reprint. Plus 400 is 1945, 400 years of testing. They failed. Gentile nation. Main nation with the pure word of God, didn't uh, pass the test, back on the road. And you think, because God loves the English people so much, and even if they trample on this book, God won't do the same with the English? You think that? Why don't you ask the Greeks how it was for 400 years to be in the Turkish Muslim occupation? Let's ask them. 400 years. 1453 to the beginning of the 20th century. You can give all the lessons of history, and these dumb, stupid, born-again Christians still think, well, but I, I like my living Bible. Don't touch my great news Bible. See there? You can give all the evidence of us, but I say, there's a good saying in America, a man uh, convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Because sheep are stupid. They don't learn nothing from history. Anyway, that was the thing on Islam, and uh, here is another one, uh, the Old Testament, God was careful not to punish the sons for the sins of the fathers, and yet it seems to me that we're paying for uh, having uh, our idiot forefathers who made a decision years ago that we never agreed to uh, embracing liberal Christianity and abandoning the authorized version. Why is it we suffer here in England for something that wasn't our fault? That's true. Uh, well. You're, you're responsible how you react to what your forefathers did. For instance, each one of us is born in a family where there are some sins of a father and mother involved. And if you look back, what you have been influenced by that kind of sin in what your father and mother, right? Now the question is, God doesn't hold you accountable for what your parents did, but how you respond to that, what your parents imparted to you. That's what you're responsible for. For instance, we have here in the Old Testament, let's take, uh, it's given for an admonition and a warning, Romans 15, 4. Uh, you know that uh, the, uh, the Jews, the two tribes, were kicked out of the land for 70 years. The 10 tribes were still out of the land for more than 2,700 years. But the Jews were kicked out uh, to Babylon for 70 years. Now, they were allowed to return. Why was that? 
Okay, it was what Jeremiah says 70 years. That's true. But God used three men mainly to confess the sins of their people on behalf of their people. Who were these three men? The three prayers recorded in the Bible. Daniel 1. Daniel 1. No. Uh, no. Ezra is the second one. Ezra 9, Nehemiah, Nehemiah 1, and Daniel 9. There are three chapters given clearly where these men confess the sins of their fathers, although they know there's a prophecy that will return to the mind after seven years. That means that what you can do is you can say, okay, our forefathers did this, this, and this, and this. That you can do and say, we're going to take a time of fasting and prayer and confess the sin of our forefathers, or whatever, and in the last years you want, to God. And maybe God in His mercy will postpone the judgment and give a, a time when Christians will go back to the Word of God. You know when it happened? Every, yeah, you know, when was, when, was, when, was, when, was, when was a day proclaimed by the king, a national day of fasting and confessing of sin for national danger? When was that? Nineveh. Yeah. Second World War. Yeah, second World War, another time. Nineveh, when the king there. Nineveh, but in England. On England. On England. I don't, I don't know about the diamond, I mean, that might be right. No, no, no. Actually, that prayer, uh, Isn't that prayer was that? All right. I know in the Spanish Armada came in 1588. Yes. Queen Elizabeth said it would be a national day of prayer and fasting. And what happened then? Well, God intervened. Yeah, God intervened. God intervened. The Dutch came, you know, and beat uh, helped the English to beat the Spanish in the canal now. That's right. <laughs> 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 they came, by the way, and they were real good beating the Spanish, but they had the little ships there. That's another thing. And there was a storm there, which hit them there in the east coast of England, and then up to Scotland there, and then in the North Irish Sea there, and it completely destroyed. And the, 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 the generals and the captains of the Spanish ships who survived the thing said, God's hand was against us. Yeah. Why? Because the whole nation went down to their knees and fasted and prayed. So that's what you can do as a nation. That's what you do as a church. You can fast and pray and say, God, we sinned. And look at a few of these uh, references there. I give you the references there. We don't have time to go over all the stuff, but... It's a heart of the truth, especially. Truth, one time, is, it's, you, know, you, have to, you have to know the truth. But then you also have to go on your knees and, and search your own heart. Nehemiah 1, let's uh, take a few of these references there. Uh, Nehemiah 1. Nehemiah is here in, uh, in the Persian king. And uh, he hears that uh, people have come and uh, tells them in verse 3 of chapter 1 of the situation of Jerusalem. Uh, verse 3, second part, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, the gates of are burned with fire. And we are in a great affliction and reproach. This is the body of Christ right now. Amen? Amen. And what does he do? Verse 4. It came to pass when I heard these words, plural, and I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And uh, he says, uh, verse um, 6, Let not thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, have not kept the commandments, nor the studies, nor the judgments, which thou hast commandest uh, thy servant Moses, the authorized version. Not sorry, that's a little uh, actual thing there. But you see the thing there? He confessed his sin, the sins of his fathers. See there? He can do that. And um, he ends there in verse um, 11. O Lord, I beseech thee, let not an ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, but the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. If you fear God, you tremble at his words. And prosper, I pray thee, the servant this day, and so forth and so on. But as Nehemiah is he comes back and he builds up the city. Right. Now that's after Ezra. Ezra has the same thing over there. And Ezra chapter uh, 9, uh, he heard that uh, the Jews were marrying strange women. And... Uh, He's not happy with that, verse 9, Ezra 9, verse 3. When I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and with my beard and sat down to stun it. And um, he said, um, verse 6, 
O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass has grown up unto the heavens. Since the day of our fathers, see there, he starts to confess the sins of his own fathers, have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion, to a face as it is this day. And uh, he keeps on going and confessing and this and that, and he finally ends up in first, uh, uh, now, uh, third, four, 14 and 15. So we again break the commandments and this and that. Uh, so he confesses his sin as, and the sin of his fathers as part of his personal guilt toward a holy and righteous God. The third man who does is Daniel. And they, all three are, when I do that, uh, I think Ezra is not in, I think he's back again in, uh, uh, in Persia. Yeah, yeah, yeah for chapter 8 he's back in Persia. Uh, so all three of them are not in Israel, they're back in, they're, they're expelled out of the land. And the last one is Daniel, from the Daniel chapter 9. I want to show you that one of the things you can do is pray and profess your sins and the sins of your fathers. That what this nation has done and maybe by God's grace, uh, he'll postpone his judgment. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse... Um, from verse 3 on. Uh, Daniel sees in Jeremiah, uh, verse 2, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And then in verse 3, he set, my, I set his face into the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sacrifice and ashes. Of course, you're going to miss it in the new versions because fasting is taken out. And he starts to uh, pray. Verse 5 We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. And he goes on and on and on. Uh, through about verse uh, oh, 13, 14, up to verse 19. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Now we know, too, that it is a judgment of God that the Gentiles, since 1917, uh, on, the, on the way down in England since 1884, the revised version, and the Jews are coming up. Shem is coming up, Jacob is coming down. Financially, economically, uh, also spiritually. The great revivals, the hunger for the Word of God is not anymore to be found in Europe. Here in the United States of America, it's to be found in China, South Korea, India. I was 15 years ago in South Korea for two times, and you had churches, Presbyterian, Methodist, uh, even Charismatics, they had seven services on a Sunday. Seven services. People can't wait to get in the church at 7 o'clock in the morning. They're waiting until 10 o'clock in the evening. It's still going on. That's shame. So God blesses the nation in South Korea. And in China, the people are hungry for the word of God. India, look at the Mark Farmer's uh, newsletters. They're hungry. No, they're in Europe anymore. Rejected the book. And confess the sins, do right yourself as a called out church, faithfully together, serving the Lord, waiting for his return, to the actively win soul, support missions there, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, support the uh, mission among the Jews, and that's what you can do. That's just as much worth for the Lord as starting revivals or going over there as a mission to India and China. Faithfulness is required. And uh, we have to uh, see that we're not always. Um, that's the question exactly here. Why is it that we suffer here in England for something that wasn't our fault? Well, you know, that's the results of, of sin in general in a nation. Look at these guys from Pakistan who came here two days ago. We have gone over there. That nation is cursed. That nation is completely blinded by Satan. There's no truth to be found at all. And these Christians are suffering under that. Why is it? Well, we're all suffering in this wicked world under a devil who's going to take over in the near future there. And the Christians in this world don't want the truth anymore. They want Jesus Christ. They don't want the kingdom of Babylon. They just want and love wickedness and darkness. And we have to suffer under it as well. 
But by God's grace, be faithful, stick together, confess the sins also of your nation, of your own soul, of your own church there, by the grace of God. You can have a revival, a, a, a healthy relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ till he comes back. Like Daniel had alone in Persia, that uh, Ezra had, that Nehemiah had. It's always a small remnant. And that's the only thing you can do. All right, let's go back to uh, some church history here. <clears throat> Nico. Yeah. So sure, thank you. Those are revivals in the, in the East. Is that, um, you say those were sparked by a Japheth missionary that's out there? Yeah, you know, almost man? always it started with Japheth, yeah. and then it's taken over by nationals because that's more and more effective. Let's be trained well doctrinally because most of the time they're enthusiastic, and when the doctrine in the Bible is not right, they go off in, in due time and it just becomes one big mess. I got a charismatics are very strong in Korea, in China, and also in India. And the main reason is that Jacob doesn't is in control or is not trained well himself. But I'd say that Jacob Starman, the ones yep. that are trained properly, yep. they're good ones, and the ones that aren't trained properly, they're more of yep. The thing is always training. The thing is always training, it either is, doesn't matter who trains them. Uh, it's, it, in the sports and economics and business life, it's all about training. You need to be trained well. And the tougher the training is in the local church, the better you are when you get out of your local church. <coughs> From the three passages there from Daniel and the other two places, I mean, if we as a church would uh, take one day a month and say they were on a fast, yeah. uh, and we're doing right, yeah. and we read the right book, yeah. and we're trying to live right and do right, right and live clean, and make sure our lives are in the right place, I mean, uh, there's nothing to say there wouldn't be a local revival within us in our area that yeah. might spread as much That's as everybody true. would take heed to the book I believe you know, that we're talking about. I believe it absolutely. Uh, I, I know there will never be a national revival there with all the internet and TV junk that's put out in your ears 24 hours a day. But a revival, a local revival, absolutely possible there. And I, I still believe, like in Switzerland, here in England, you can build a normal, healthy, Bible-believing work of uh, 50 to 100 people there when the people go down, fast, and pray. The trouble is not the lack of biblical preaching, teaching between these Bible. It's not the problem. The problem is the hard people. When hard people get right with God, God can start to move. And it may take a couple of years. But fasting and praying is the main thing. I've seen it in our church in St. Gallen there. And it starts with the pastor, of course. It starts with me there, I think. But I did for, for, for a long time. Fast one or two days a week. Just as, as uh, everybody gets used to it. We're good too, you know, you don't get pick up too much fat anyway. Uh, food is too good over in England even. And then uh, some of the guys say, hey, this is a good idea. We want to fast, say, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, we want to fast. I asked my wife, many times we had the best times in the church were on Wednesday nights. There was a liberty to preach and teach, and I was always fasting on Wednesday. And other guys were fasting on Wednesday, too, especially when one of the guys had a baby with a very heavy, severe heart uh, deformation. And uh, we, were, we had a reason to fast, and uh, some of them are still fasting. But for a long time, the Wednesday nights were great times, great prayer meetings, great liberty. I was teaching, I was preaching there, and people were talking up to 9, 30, 10 o'clock or so. Great time of fellowship. I was through fasting and prayer. So I can encourage you that. So with the pastor, and then with the man of the church, say, oh no, fasting. You have to figure it out. You know, if you just do one day a month or one day a week fasting, you find out how much you're addicted to food. It's just incredible. Just skip two meals or three meals, one day a week or one day a month. You think, you, you think about food all the time, and you think you're such a poor man, you know. And you're going to appreciate the Muslims, <laughs> they're really, who fast from sun uh, up to sun down a whole month, a year. Amen. Why don't you try it out for a month? <laughs> don't eat anything, you know. From sun up to sun down, I guarantee you that you, you find how stuck you are, how uh, addicted you are to food. Because you think about food all the time, and plus you have to deportion your whole body, because you junk all the time, and that when you drink water, you, that the uh, portion has to get out of your body. Anyway, we could uh, fast in the wintertime here because the sun never comes up, so yeah. we just fast full of sunshine and we're full of the pastor. That's, That's, why the Muslims, guys. That's why the Muslims never go really f that far north. Hey, That's what they said. More than Alaska. Okay, now, say we do this, the Lord starts blessing, and by the grace of God, we'll try to talk about this in the church and try to do that. And we'll do by the grace of God. Um, what would stop that revival is running good and things are going well? What's going to stop the revival once it gets rolling like that? Another Christian 
always here who uh, feels he doesn't get the attention he deserves or she deserves she, she needs or he needs and he's going to mess it up for envy most of the time like Satan did it when he could get the attention Jesus Christ got in eternity and he became envious and proud of his own beauty and this and that and that. it's always some kind of Christian mainly and, and, and most of the time a young man who's going to mess things up most of the time or a woman who feels you know she needs to be in charge of the whole thing with a general Jezebel but it's always a Christian. It's never a Muslim or the government. It's always another born again Christian, closely connected with the man who starts the preaching and teaching the revival. It's always there. All right. Um, here's some um, some little stuff on the uh, church history there. And sorry again for the poor quality of the uh, material, but I'll try to explain a little bit here. Here we have, uh, we talk about Bible believing Christian Christians, and here is uh, Greece, Turkey, Italy, Spain here, uh, Holland, England, Denmark. This is Bible believing Christians between 500 and 1500 AD. And they're like a half moon spread out around Europe here. In the dark ages when Rome was running the show for a thousand years, and killing every possible boarding and bombing preacher or church they could get their hands on. Uh, they, had, they were here mainly in the Eastern Roman Empire in 1453 here. When that went down, they came up here to the Northwestern Europe, at least the, the guys with the Greek manuscript, left them in the universities here. Erasmus put them together in 1560 in Basel, Switzerland. And Luther translated in his 1522 New Testament. Tyndale left England, went to Germany, where the Reformation was already going on, because he could not translate the pure word of God uh, from Greek into uh, English. And he had he visited Luther and got a copy of his September Testament, 1522, used it for his first translation in English, 1526. He was betrayed right here in Belgium, strangled and burned at the stake by the Church of Rome. But this book he made is still 99% the basis for the New Testament of the Authorized Version 1611. Then, as when we came up here, did the same thing, called it up here. But if you look at the place where they did it, here are the mountains, the Pyrenees. These are the Alps here. The Barbarian groups were the Albigens in South France, northwest of Italy in the Alps. And the Baptists came up here in Zwingli and Zurich. Uh, the the uh, Hutterites came up here in the south of Austria and the Alps here. The Moravians came up here. They finally went to, uh, in section to Zinzendorf's place there where they got the, called them the Hanhunters. And, uh, and up here, it's a kind of half moon here, and they were hiding mainly in the mountains from the Church of Rome. So that's where they were hiding, and when the Reformation broke loose, this part of Europe picked up the uh, Reformation, that is, mainly the Germanic people, not the Latin people. The Latin people, Italian, France, Spain, the never, Reformation never got through there. Most of the translations were made here, or printed in the Netherlands or London, England. There was no liberty at all here, because the Inquisition, the Jesuits, were killing Christians and Bible believers, and people had a Bible left and right. It was in the mountains done, and over the mountains, on the other side, where Rome couldn't get their hands on. Uh, so the Bible believing groups were all here for more than 1,500 years. They all had a text like a King James Bible. And it came through here. All these guys here, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Tillium, were all former Roman Catholic priests and monks. They got the book. They went away from the Church of Rome because the book opened their eyes. That's why this book, King James Bible, or any book, Luther, Russell, New Testament, German Bible, is still on the list of forbidden books by the Church of Rome up till today. Good question. Right. Is the NIV or any of the new versions on that hit list as no. far as uh, the only the King James Bible, the English Bible? Any list? Reformation Bible. Any Reformation from the Antioch that takes on it is forbidden. Luther's on there, King James. Right. But not an NIV or an RSV. No, none of them is on it. Here is a, um, another thing, this is a real mess of course, but uh, yeah, I'll explain it in a minute. This is um, the, uh, the text of Antioch. As you know, the, the church uh, of God started there in Acts chapter 2, you could say. 
about the disciples of Christ were only first called Christians when they came to Antioch, Acts 11, 26 here. And it was the place where Paul always started missionary journeys. He started uh, three of them. And he always came back right here in Antioch. And that's the capital of Syria. That's a Shemitic country there. And their business were copying the pure words of God and uh, training missionaries and evangelists and translators. And for instance, uh, they translated from there the Armenian and the Georgian Bible, the Diatessal Temptation there. Uh, the Peshitta, the old, the queen of the virgin in Syria was made there. Uh, these are all pure words of God. Another center of Christianity was Alexandria, Egypt, mentioned after Alexander the Great, Alex, which our words are mixed there, one of the great types of the Antichrist, the Greek who came from, or the Macedonian there, who came from the west to the east. That's how the Antichrist will come from Rome to Jerusalem. His name is not mentioned, but I always think that the uh, the, the man of sin will be when he has Japhetic blood, probably be Greek blood, because Alexander the Great is not mentioned by name. In Alexandria, they started to corrupt the word of God. It's an African country, from the land of Ham, which is Egypt, and it's the hotbed of heresies. And this is known for subtracting from the word of God. And the third big city in the Roman Empire the number one was Rome. First you had Rome, then Alexandria, then Antioch. Rome is in Europe. It's a Caucasian country or a Javitic country. Europe, Africa, Asia. Javit, Ham, Shen. Rome was known for adding to the word of God, Apocrypha. This is subtracted from the word of God. Is just copying the word of God faithfully. Now, what happened there? <clears throat> Paul was preaching and ministering mainly here, Greece and uh, Asia Minor, present Turkey. And this is where the pure word of God was copied and copied and copied. So, all the church fathers writing from here had the, said the King James text. All the uncials, meaning managers that block capital letters, had the King James text. All the curses, which are manuscripts written a little later, say from the 9th century on, with small letters, had the King James text. The Gothic Bible, Ulf and Phyllis, uh, from Dasha here, was written in the Byzantine King James text. The Slavonic translation was written in the King James text. The Church Fathers writing from here had a King James text more than the corrupt text. The European Latin had the King James text more than the corruptions from Egypt. Even in North Africa, the church fathers here and the church fathers here near Caesarea, they, although they were heavily influenced by the Egyptian corruptions, had more King James readings as they had corrupted readings in. So you could say that with the exception of this area here, and a little bit this area here, all the other areas in the Roman Empire were uh, the pure word of God uh, in all translations, in manuscripts and block capital letters, in later manuscripts with small capital letters, uh, quotes by the church fathers. Here started the first ecumenical university in the world by an apostle Jew Philo, uh, later uh, followed up by uh, Origen. He was such a heretic, this Origen, he had to flee, was kicked out, excommunicated by the bishop from Alexandria. He went to Caesarea with this uh, bunch of copyists, and that's where he died. He left his library to Eusebius, and Eusebius was the one, bishop of Caesarea, was called upon by Constantine, the first emperor, who also became head of the state, to make uh, 50 state Bibles. So the Vatican, manuscript with Apocrypha, between 330 and 350, went from Caesarea uh, to Rome. The pure word of God was corrupt in Alexandria, when they took manuscripts from Syria in 150 AD, Greek manuscript between 100 and 200 AD to Alexandria, and the old Latin from North Africa to Alexandria, this was, was all corrupted, and it went back there in the Alexandrian readings in the old Latin, but at 200 AD. Uh, Jerome's Latin Vulgate, which was made in Bethlehem, heavily influenced by Caesarea, uh, around 450 AD. So the trouble was really Alexandria, and from there on, Caesarea.
Now here's a little uh, overview, which hopefully is a help. And it says, <coughs> we start here with the originals. So what God has given uh, Peter, Paul, and John and so forth here. And here is the line of the Holy Spirit, and here's the line of Satan. He is the great imitator. Paul, Ignatius, and Polycarp, of course, of John. Chrysostom, the man of the golden mouth from Byzantium, the great preacher. The Lombards in England, the followers of John Wycliffe. The Waldensians, the uh, followers of Waldo from Lyon in the northwest of Italy there. Started all in Antioch, or Byzantium, the head of the Eastern Roman Empire there. The Bulgarians, the Belgians were influenced by these translations and preachers. North Italy, South France, Germany, Netherlands, England and USA. That is the line God the Holy Spirit used these Bibles and preachers from uh, East to West. That's how the Holy Spirit's line moves a lot of times, East to West. Uh, the man connected with these preachers are, or, or, or line of uh, Bible believers is are Luther, Swingley, Wesley, Whitfield, Tyndale, uh, Speeder, Zinzendorf, two guys from Germany who were greatly uh, used by God to get Wesley saved. John Knox, the great uh, preacher from Scotland, uh, for whom Ma Body Mary trembled when he started to pray. Uh, Whitfield, the great um, public preacher. Charles Finney, Moody, and Sunday responsible for 2 million souls being saved in the 19th century. And in the 20th century, Bob Young Sr. and G. Frank Norris, the last man. The Texas tornado, who uh, was already shown the importance of a more evangelistic means, but citywide, but the local church, where right now I think the revivals in the West are um, uh, stuck to. From that, you see an imitation. Never the, the Church of God, the last 1,900 years, embraced these false Bibles, with the exception of the last. 120 years in England, uh, since the Revived Version came out. Philo, an apostate Jew, started this first ecumenical university in Alexandria, Egypt, where Greek mythology and uh, Judaism and Christianity were trying to be combined, to be accepted by the world, as well as by Jews and Christians. Uh, the New Age theology, as you call it, it's uh, 1,800 years old. Clement, Followed him up, Origen followed him up, Augustine, another North African, followed him up, and Jerome, who translated the Latin Vulgate from the Hebrew and the Greek into the Latin in 450, uh, commissioned by Pope Damasbik, who became Pope, over the bodies of more than 100 of his adversaries. The lands connected with that of Egypt, the land of Ham, Rome, where now the throne of Satan is, according to Revelation 13, Spain, never had any revival, neither Italy, France, Mexico, South America, and all the popes there, ending up in Rome 666, where the man of sin will come up before he becomes king of Jerusalem. The manuscripts connected with these countries and these false teachers are Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, two state Bibles, politically correct Bibles, made by Eusebius, uh, commissioned by Emperor Constantine for a state should set up. Characteristic for these two false uh, manuscripts are 2,000 plus words are missing in the New Testament alone. So that's about the whole book of Romans, I think. And the Apocrypha are added. Apocrypha means the hidden books are added. Blavatsky says about that that in the Apocrypha is the poison of the, um, the mythology hidden. And of course, as a result, you have World War I, World War II, and United Bible Societies with the American Bible Society, Dutch Bible Society, English Bible Society. They are corrupt Bible Societies. Their purpose is to spread satanical imitation of the pure word of God all over the world. Now, why is this? It's real simple. Man is religious by nature, so you have to give him something which has some truth, but not all the truth. So these verses will be used to usher in the acceptance of a future man of sin which should be accepted by everybody, religious or not religious, as the Christ, the uh, Savior of the world. Now, a lot of times you hear people say, well, 
A translation can never be inspired. Or we have to go back to the original languages. Now the question is, how, how do you respond to that? This real practical stuff, which you can use, and the best would be to make a note in your Bible. How do you respond to that? Well, for instance, we have a few examples. Uh, here we have a timeline, uh, 4,000 years before Christ, 9 years after Christ. Uh, the Bible was written about 1,500 before Christ to 19 after Christ, and occurred about 1,600 years. The conversation between Moses and Pharaoh, recorded in Exodus 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, was in Egyptian. It was not in Hebrew at all. The Pharaoh could not speak Hebrew. So it was written down in Egyptian, but a translation written down is in Hebrew. So it's a translation from the original language to the Hebrew, but the Hebrew is still inspired, amen? Then the second thing you see is here, uh, Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, Darius, king of Persia, Nebuchadnezzar, king of uh, Babylon, they uh, put out some decrees in Daniel 3, Daniel 6, and Esther 8, and these decrees are in different languages, and certainly not in uh, Aramaic or in Hebrew. They're probably far in Persian. But they're given in Hebrew and Aramaic. So, again, that translation can certainly be inspired according to God's uh, own writing. Then you have here, in Luke 23, 38, that Pontius Pilate writes on a table on the, above the head of Jesus Christ on the cross, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. It's in three languages, the language of Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Ham, Latin, Japheth, Greek, Hebrew, Shem. They're all inspired, but they're in three different languages. That's another thing to uh, think, think about. When you have a Luther Bible in German, a King James in English, a Louis Vuitton in French, and Valera in Spanish, um, a State Bible in Dutch, they're all God's words in these different languages. You don't have to change them. Now, the authorized version is the absolute truth in the international languages before the rapture. That's the standard. Why? There's only one standard. You say, well, it's the same with temperature, absolute temperature, location, and time is in England, as far as I know. I know the French don't like that, neither the Germans, but it's just a fact. Even the Germans and the French, even the French accept that. Absolute time, location, and temperature is English. So absolute truth in the international language of the world is in English. That doesn't mean that the other languages yeah. cannot have God's mm -hmm. words in their language. See, it doesn't contradict each other like the people try to make you think. Here we have Acts 2, 6 and 11. We have a bunch of uh, apostles who preach the word of God. And uh, look what it says there. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 6 and 11. And make it note because I'm going to get you on that. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitudes came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Verse 11, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. All these guys who spoke, the 12 apostles, spoke in different languages to be understood and all these sermons were inspired by God. See there? God is not restricting himself to one language. Finally, here around between around 50 and 70 AD AD, you have a bunch of quotes, in especially the book of Matthew, but also other epistles, in Greek from the Old Testament as a fulfillment, and they're a direct quote from the Hebrew translated into Greek. There are more than 40 verses in the original Greek, which are translations from the original Hebrew and still inspired. So you have here one, two, three, four, five examples of translations in the original Greek, original Hebrew, from all languages than they originally spoken in, and they're still inspired. So God is not restricting himself to one language to be inspirational. Anybody can see that when you are a little experience on the street or soul winning, and you pick up another language and you try to explain in another language the gospel to somebody and he gets saved, he gets saved because you explain the gospel in his own language he can understand. So God uses your words 
uh, God's bre Holy Spirit breathes on them, and eternal life is imparted to the daughter of eternal soul. Simple as that. But what does a, a stuffed up professor somewhere in a little office in Oxford or Cambridge know about that? Never had a soul to Jesus Christ, probably even saved himself. Now, I want to say a little bit, uh, not too much, about the corrupt Old Testament. I want to say two things of it, but let's start with the corruptions here. I hope to give you a little bit later a list of a couple of verses, which are in the authorized version, and they're not in any Hebrew Old Testament, not even in the so-called ben Masoretic text, which proves that there is not one standard Hebrew Old Testament or you can say, this is underlying the direct text of the King James Bible. I'll give you the verses later. I want to speak now about the corrupt Old Testament text. Um, you have the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Essene sect uh, right now overlooked and published by the Pontifical Biblical Institute of Rome, of course. And mixing it with the Hebrew Targum, Syriac versions, Samaritan Pentateuch, and Josephus. These are all non-inspired uh, alteration of the pure word of God, oftentimes used today in the margin of the new versions as authoritative. Then the Vatican is Old Testament in Greek. They call it or print it as a Septuagint, a Greek translation supposedly made the third century before Christ. Actuality, this, this thing is fabricated the fourth century after Christ. Um, they have other men here who made also a Greek translation from the Hebrew Old Testament called Aquila, Simachus, Theodosian, uh, Jerome's Juxta Hebraica, Latin Vulgate, he translated Hebrew in Latin Vulgate there. Uh, we see here that the Hebrew vowels change between the 4th and the 10th century and there are textual and marginal variants. It's very important because the present ben Masoretic text, published by the Trinitarian Bible Society, has his textual marginal of rhymes and the authorized version uh, man translates use these to get their text together. In other words, there is not one book on the face of this earth in Hebrew which has all the Hebrew words underlying the authorized version. I give you a list, uh, hopefully tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, where you can see and check in your own Hebrew uh, Old Testament that they're not in every any Hebrew Old Testament available. Which means the AV 1611 translators use different manuscripts with a Hebrew Old Testament Bible to get their English text together. Disseminated in the Greek New Testament. They had one Greek Testament together and the Old Latin and some other things, and they put together their English text on the basis of that. There is not the Old Testament Hebrew, the Old Testament Greek. <coughs> we have one book in English, that's your authority. Then around 1800 up to today, you have coming up an anti-Semitism and higher criticism, mainly in Germany. Right now, the new trend is to accuse Martin Luther of Hitler's Holocaust. Mm. That's a new trend. Because right. Hitler spoke against the Jews, and they said, well, you know, that's what Hitler picked up, you know, so Hitler is really, or Martin Luther is really indirectly responsible for the Holocaust. Well, if you think like that, you have to think about what God says. Uh, Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, who was burdened and almost went to death so that the Jews could get saved. You know what he wrote? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 about the Jews. I mean, I speak here about those who are not saved. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse. Um, no, what's the reference there? Um, yeah, verse 15 and of verse 14. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14, For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they, the Jews please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to put their sins all away. That's what Paul says about the Jews. Unsaved Jews. That's not anti-Semitic, that's historical fact. So when Luther speaks these things, they make him indirectly responsible for the Holocaust. I'll talk about it a little later too, what the Holocaust means, but anybody of you knows what the Holocaust means? 
Tell them the other night. Oh, I told them the other night. I've betrayed everything already. Anyway, I have to study this thing. You know where the word comes from? The arrives translation, burnt offering in Leviticus. It's a burnt offering. And now think about it. Who decides that killing six million Jews should be called the Holocaust? A word from a Roman Catholic Dora Rhymes translation from 1582. Explain me that. Who thinks about a thing like that? Saint. Who? The Saint. Yeah, it is. It's a burnt offering. But nobody knows what the Holocaust is. The Holocaust, the Holocaust. What the Holocaust means? Well, I don't know. See, you copy something without knowing what the word means. It's a burnt offering. Somebody wants to have a burnt offering for six million Jewish body. Who might that be? Anyway, the guys involved in this thing, which end up in the Holocaust, Rudolf Kittel, tried for uh, the Nuremberg trials for inspiration, inspiring Hitler and wrong stuff, uh, putting out the Biblia Hebrea Sudertensia, the corrupt Hebrew Bible, which now is used for every possible modern version of the Old Testament, Gesenius German Hebrew Dictionary, unsafe German rationalist, Translated into English by Brown, Driver, and Briggs, very well known, um, by Henderson put out, used the uh, Strong's Concordance numbers. And Ginsburg, critical benefiting text, all of them are used for the Old Testament text, the New King James Bible. It's a very bad text. And these, these things, Dead Sea Scrolls, Vatican's Old Testament, Greek, called Septuagint, and of course, the Letter Gardensis, which is basically. This one, Biblia Vigas and Catentia, in a Bible form, is the Old Testament text of all the new versions. So here you have the whole thing, the whole sham, put out, either in New King James or new versions. It's completely corrupted in the Old Testament. It's not to be trusted at all. It's a play on words. Now finally, in the New Testament are the biggest changes made. And this is what I call the most scientifically trustworthy New Testament. It's called Nestle Island Greek New Testament, or also put out by the United Bible Society as the Greek New Testament. This is a very unreliable, unscientific piece of trash. I repeat that. It's a very unreliable, unscientific piece of trash for the following reasons. First of all, only 92% of the manuscripts in Greek, in block capital letters, are cited. 100% uh, of the paper period are cited. Why? Because they are mostly from Egypt, closer to Alexandria, Egypt. So mostly have Alexandrian meridians. 7% of all the cursives are cited. Why only 7%? Because most cursives are from Antioch, from Byzantium, from the King James text. Only 0.02% of the lectionaries, the readings in the churches are mentioned. Why? Because all of them are King James text. One of 2,000. And 33% of the old versions or translations are cited, mainly those who have general readings. Only 24% of the church fathers are cited, mainly those who witness against the King James text. So it is not scientific at all. It's a pro-Roman Catholic Jesuit piece of trash. That's all there is to it. Now here's an example. You have different witnesses to get a Greek New Testament. You have, for instance, peppery, a little piece of peppery there. Uh, mainly from Egypt, with words or passages of scripture on it. You have 88, 1997. Of these 88, 13 were from um, uh, Alexandria, or Western Horde type. 75 were receptors type, King James type. That's in percentages, 70% against 83%. The Unschuls are the block capital Greek manuscripts from the first till about the Oh, 6th, 7th century. You have 267 of them, and none of them are from Alexandria. 258 are from Antioch, or 3 versus 97%. The cursives, which are Greek manuscripts in small letters written from the 8th, 9th century on up to the 15th century, there are 2,764 of them. 23 are from Egypt. 2,741 are Antiochian character. One versus 99%. Now I understand why so few were uh, quoted by Nestle Allen. <laughs> and the lectionaries, which are the readings in the churches, there are 2,143 of them, and all of them are Antiochian in character, 100%. So put them all together, you have here 5,262 manuscripts, 
45 are from Alexandria, Alexandrian type. 5,217 are King James Antiochian type, or 99%. Now, the figures for 2008 are now 5,695. And as far as I know, the majority of all the stuff now discovered is in type King James Antiochian type. So, 1%, plus than 50, builds up the Greek text of this so-called scientifically uh, testament, which is the base for the new versions. See what happens? You've been lied to all the time. And this material is unavailable for any theological student anywhere, Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Cambridge, uh, Oxford, or anywhere in the continent. Now, finally, <clears throat> if you say, I want to find out if I have a good Bible or not, how can I find out? Real practical. Here is a simple checklist. And that's, we start with the English text of the King James Bible. And some of these references are not to be found in the Reformation Bibles of other nations. That's why I say the King James is purified seven times. You see certain revelations which you cannot find in the German, Luther, the Dutch State Bible, or any other continental Bible. Uh, I'll give you very short what you have to look for. Acts 1 3, the word infallible. There are infallible proofs. The word infallible is missing in the new versions. And fellow proofs about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 20, 28, it speaks about the blood of Jesus Christ is the blood of God. The blood of God. Jesus had blood, it was the blood of God. It's changed in all the new Bibles. Acts 4, 27, 30 uh, speaks about Jesus being a holy child of God, changed into holy servant of God. Attack on the deity of Jesus Christ. Acts 2, Verse 27 and 31 speaks about Jesus Christ went to hell. His soul went to hell after he died. Changed no new Bibles in death or in Hades or something else. Then in the very important reference which uh, reveals the uh, heart of the Bible correctors in the book of Romans, chapter 1, especially here in England, you see that coming up. And you probably can say amen on that when you read the verse. Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Uh, the new Bibles change the word hold and suppress in order to cover up their, chain, their sins. But they have the truth, they hold it in their hands, it's in unrighteousness. You can hold it in your hand but in unrighteousness, doing wrong. Verse 25, from Romans 1, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The word changed is substituted with the word exchange in the new Bibles, because the scholars on the revision committees didn't want the wretched sin in being exposed. What is their sin? 2 Corinthians 2, uh, verse 17, or in the days of Paul, where there is many which corrupt the word of God. The new versions change what corrupt to peddling or handling deceitfully or something else. James 5.16. We see there we're supposed to confess our faults, not our sins to one another. Mm -hmm. Any Catholic has sins, amatias, instead of faults. 2 Timothy 3, verse 3, again, these are typical, specifically King James readings, which you can hardly find in any other Bible, including other Reformation Bibles. 2 Timothy 3, verse 3, without natural affection, truth brazers, false accusers, incontinental fears, despisers of those that are good. That's something missing, despisers of those that are good in all the new Bibles. Uh, despise of, of, of the good, says a lot of people. But it says, despise of those that are good. Who are good? Those who love Jesus Christ and his words. Second Timothy 2.15, study to show the self approved. The word study is missing in all the new Bibles. Mm -hmm. I haven't found, I found one in French, Martin 1855. That's the word étudier. That's an extraordinary thing. And the rest have all uh, be diligent or do your best or something else. In other words, study, you have to study to be able to write the divine word of truth, you won't be ashamed as a pastor when you have to give account of what you've been teaching and preaching to your people at the image of Jesus Christ. 
1 Timothy 6 verse 5, that verse is missing in a lot of Bibles because it is mentioned only twice in the New Testament and when it is taken out once, uh, in this case 1 Timothy 6 verse 5, the last uh, four words from such withdraw thyself. You have to withdraw yourself from whom? Verse 5, the beginning, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. What is the truth? Thy word is the truth. The authorized verses 6 and 11 in English. If people don't have that, withdraw yourself from these men. It's missing in all the new battles. Withdraw yourself from these men. Then verse 10 is a very well known verse. The love of money is the root of all, of all evil. That's the reason for all the new Bibles being produced all the time, copyright laws. Uh, change to its a the root of all evil in all the new versions. 1 Timothy 6, verse 20, uh, a unique re 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 rendering in the authorized version. It says, and warrants for science falsely so called. The word science is changed to knowledge. And that way, cutting out the reference to the institution of higher learning uh, in England, in Oxford, in Cambridge, Edinburgh, where the Word of God is uh, attacked in the English King James Bible uh, in the name of science. You have to check if anything is scientific with one final authority. This is this book. Well, then a few more verses, which you can, it's not specifically for the King James, but it's a good one to check in any. Uh, uh, other uh, version, Colossians 1.14, uh, it gives a lie in all the new versions. It says there we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, even the forgiveness of sins, the word through his blood are omitted there, which makes um, the redemption of the soul equal to the forgiveness of sins, which is a lie. In the Old Testament, a soul could not be redeemed, but a soul could be forgiven. Redemption is through the blood. The blood of God, Acts 20, 28, which was not shed until Jesus Christ came as God manifested in the flesh. Acts 8, 37 is missing in all the new, Bible, new Bibles. That's the condition to getting baptized is believing with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, that's what all the apostate uh, Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants say. 1 John 5, 7 and 8, the Trinity is attacked here. And finally, 1 Timothy 3. And uh, we also discussed the fruit of these two streams of Bibles through history, to be more specific, through 20 centuries of history. Because the Bible, Jesus Christ himself said, God manifests in the flesh by uh, the fruits you shall know them. Now here is a small overview, and uh, don't worry about it, you can't read it well, we just take different parts and then uh, look upon it more in detail which shows you the providential preservation of the text of the New Testament in different languages.
Now also we discussed God is not hindered by one language. God can inspire his words or giving them inspiration just as easy in one language as the other language. We discussed two centers of uh, Bible preservation, uh, what is it called, Bible corruption, Antioch, uh, first time in uh, Acts 11, uh, uh, sorry, in, I think in the scripture it's mentioned the first time in Acts chapter 6, if I remember correctly, verse 5, there is one of the six deacons, the six deacons is Nicholas, uh, from Antioch, and then uh, like Acts 11 verse 26, the first time the disciples of Jesus Christ are called Christians is in Antioch, a, a Gentile city where Gentile Christians gather together in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we also discussed Rome, the third center, the main center in the Roman Empire. Uh, we discussed that Rome is the center where the words are added to the text, the Apocrypha were put there to the uh, Old Testament canon. And it's mentioned in 1st of Acts chapter 2, verse 10, where people from Rome, Jews from Rome are there, uh, will get saved by the preaching of the apostles. Alexandria is once uh, first mentioned in New Testament, Acts chapter 6, verse 9. It's a synagogue of Alexandrians, Jews, and uh, the end of the book of Acts is mentioned again twice in Acts 27, verse 6, and Acts 28, verse 11, where there is a ship from Alexandria which takes Paul to Rome. Now that's spiritualized today how the ships of uh, Alexandria, the false Bibles, carry the body of Christ or the professing Christians back to Rome through the ecumenical charismatic movement. Mm -hmm. And I have a sermon on that, but I don't have time to do about that. But it's really interesting to study the book of Acts 27, 28 and see the principles involved in uh, how Paul is taken from an Alexandrian ship back into a prison in Rome. That's exactly what the body of Christ is going to now. So <clears throat> here we discuss that the center of Mission activity in the New Testament is Antioch. That's where they copied the Word of God and translated the Word of God in different languages. And finally ends up here in the King James Version of the Bible here. Alexandria was the first ecumenical university started by an apostle Jew Philo and through different men, uh, Clement of Alexandria there, Origen there, Eusebius there. We discussed the Vatican manuscript there, the Sinaiticus manuscript there. And uh, finally it ends up in all the new versions, including the New King James Bible. And the fruit of this line of Bibles is warfare, bloodshed, darkness, and the Dark Ages for more than a thousand years. The fruit of this line of Bibles is um, holy churches, evangelists, the great revivals, the Philadelphia Church Age, and uh, the Reformation, which made England free from the yoke of Rome about 500 years ago. England going back to this book since around 1884, the revised version coming out, mainly done by Westcott and Hort, has plunged England back under the authority of Rome through the European Union in Brussels, and just a matter of time, till England loses its complete sovereignty again to Rome. Now we're going to discuss it a little bit more in detail and then uh, discuss more about these two strange birds, Westcott and Horde, to, uh, I'll call that uh, closet Roman Catholics, unsaved, hell-bound sinners who pretended to be Protestant Anglicans, but who hated Jesus Christ, hated the Word of God, were not born again, and right now, I'm sure, are in one of the deepest pits of hell, burning. Mm -hmm. According to their own testimonies when it comes to the work and person of Jesus Christ. Now, these two persons are held in high esteem today in almost all the Protestant seminaries and Catholic seminaries and Bible schools today. Anyway. All right, let's um, discuss this in a little bit in more detail. This is the... Uh, providential preservation of the uh, new text of the New Testament there. Uh, 
Acts 11, 26, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch, the apostles, then the original New Testament manuscripts written down by uh, these Jewish Christians till 90 AD, then uh, the translation into Syrian, where Antioch was part of, around 150 AD, the Peshitta, the Queen of Persians, then the Old Latin and Syriac, about 200 AD, then the Pepri uh, of the manuscripts of the Textus Receptus, these are from Egypt, uh, till about 400 AD, and then the Unshu manuscripts of the Receptus, which are block capital letters, till about uh, oh, 700, 800 AD, and then you have here the um, uh, the Rodensian Bibles there, 11, 12, 1300 there. They're translated into Latin and French. And finally, at the bottom there, you see the uh, Greek New Testament uh, of Erasmus here. Which, what he did is he put the Greek New Testaments together of the Greek church, who preserved them till about 1453, to the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire. Martin Luther translated that uh, Bible from Erasmus, the New Testament, into German between 1522 and 1534. And uh, Tyndale in Germany did the same thing for the English, uh, which follows after his death Coverdale, Matthew, Great, the Great Bible, and finally Geneva and the Bishop's Bible. They're all in this line of uh, manuscripts here. And uh, you have here Stephen's Greek New Testament, uh, made in Paris, and Beta's Greek New Testament, uh, one of the ten he made in Geneva, and finally the authorized version 1611. The words of the Lord are pure words, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's a promise of God's preservation of his words up in the English language till 1611. It was the beginning of the Philadelphia church age where the translators paid a high price most of the time of their own blood or the blood of their family members to keep and preserve the words of God. Now Protestantism here starts around the 1520s and comes all down there. The Anabaptists already were much older and had these pure word of gods uh, way longer. And we discussed that yesterday in different names and different uh, church groups. Uh, they were later uh, called Mennonites, um, the Quakers, uh, Baptists, and finally the English Baptists. Now then we're going to discuss the other side, the Alexandria side, the side where Satan started to corrupt the Word of God. You say, when did it start? Well, according to the King James Bible in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, it was already around 50, 55 A.D., when Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2, 17, we're not as many which corrupt the word of God. So the devil will not waste any time attacking his words. So the corruptions here start with uh, Gnosticism, Arianism, and pagan philosophy. And uh, it is done in Alexander, the hotbed of uh, heresies. Petri manuscripts throughout 200 AD, P75, for instance, have been heavily influenced by the heretical readings and teachings of Alexandria. Clement was a famous teacher at the Alexandrian uh, Catechal School, Origen followed him up. Eusebius uh, followed Origen to Caesarea, where Constantine the Great, the emperor who was head of the state as well as head of the church, ordered 50 state Bibles from Eusebius. Well, we believe that Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are uh, leftovers. And uh, Jerome in 382 translated the Latin Vulgate, meaning he took these uh, crept manuscripts from Eusebius in Caesarea, uh, in Bethlehem where he was, translated them in the New Testament in uh, Latin, and he took the Apocrypha and put them between the books of the Old Testament, a part of the Old Testament canon. That's what you see here, Constantine here, as the emperor who uses Greek corrupt state Bibles and a, and a Latin corrupt Bible in the west of the Roman Empire. 
as a result, because the West accepted that and it was the main capital, the West get destroyed about 100 years later, 476, by the Huns or the Goths. Now, the Dark Ages start in the West. The Eastern Roman Empire stays alive for another thousand years till 1453. And when the Eastern Roman Empire goes down, which covers present Turkey and Western Turkey and Greece, these Greek scientists and um, manuscripts go over the Balkans to the Western European universities where Erasmus puts them together uh, when he travels around in a Greek New Testament published in 1516 and Luther used the second edition of 1519 of Erasmus to make his 1522 uh, German uh, translation and that shakes the foundations and the power of Rome so much that with Tyndale's and Luther's Bible both translated into German in the 1520s they lose hold the whole Northwestern Europe plus the USA plus Australia and New Zealand. These two books did that work. Now, I'll see a little further the corrupt manuscript of Alexandrinus. Alexandrinus, together with uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, are the three manuscripts which also compromise the, uh, all, what they call the Septuagint, the Old Testament in Greek, uh, with the Apocrypha in it. That's how corrupt they are. They don't tell you that, but uh, these three manuscripts they say are the oldest and the best, have the Old Testament also in it, and the Apocrypha as part of the Old Testament canon between the books of the Old Testament. You don't read it in any uh, book on textual criticism or Old Testament or New Testament in any school that shows the hypocrisy of the people who are involved in this. On the basis of these corrupt manuscripts, in 1582 is translated the Dua Rhymes Bible in the north of France. Why? Uh, because the Jesuits had to flee England because any Jesuit who was captured here was put to death and hanged. <laughs> Good old days. Yeah. Why? Uh, under a list of more than a hundred Jesuits were hanged. Mm. You know that? Good. You say why? They were there to kill the king, blow up the parliament, and if you know anything about Guy Fawkes Day, you know what Guy Fawkes did? Or tried to do? Yeah. No. Blow up the whole parliament, plus the queen. That's what Rome still wants to do, just do it a different way. So that's why they killed the Jesuits and hanged them. And the Jesuits had to flee to the continent. And in Rheims, a little town in the north of uh, France, they made this uh, uh, Bible. And of course, you see, they started translating in English after Tyndale already did it in 1525-26. So Rome gives this satanic limitation after they know we cannot stop the people from reading the Word of God in the vernacular of the common language. I've been there in, in Rhymes with uh, Eubanks there. Uh, this guy bombed the Vatican with gospel tracts. And uh, there is a huge plaque in front of the cathedral where it says, around 50, uh, 1960, here were Konrad Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle uh, brought together by Monsignor so-and-so, a Catholic guy from, the, from Rhymes, uh, to get the foundation stone of the European Union or the revived new Roman Empire. Right there in uh, Rhymes, where they made this satanic limitation of the pure word of God in English. All right, then we're going to go to the bottom of this thing. Go ahead, go. Well, that last one you had, um, Wycliffe, thir 1380. Did he have any influence on uh, on Luther? I mean, was Luther influenced by any of his writings or the Lollard or who was that? Uh, in 1380, Wycliffe, New Testament, oh, yeah. English, did Wycliffe have any influence on Martin Luther? Yes, uh, yeah, that's a good question there. Um, uh, John Wycliffe, uh, I don't know how he picked all this stuff, but I think he had the old Latin. And uh, here you see the connection with the Latin Vulgate. And if you take the Wycliffe, New Testament today, indeed it is pretty much after the Latin Vulgate. But I believe this could be corrupted, and the original Wycliffe was not according to the Latin Vulgate, but according to the old Latin. And um, Wycliffe's writings were very strong anti-Rome and anti-Pope. He died in peace, but his body was uh, dug up and then burned, and uh, his ashes uh, thrown away. And Wycliffe's writings were highly influential in the conversion and the ministry of John Huss in Prague. 
and his successor, Jerome of Prague, both were burned at the stake in constant Germany in the 15th century. And uh, the Hussites, the followers of Prague, uh, later fought real uh, military battles against the armies of Rome, who tried to destroy them and wipe them out completely. Now, Prague and the Hussites in the Czech Republic are relatively close, or very close, to Saxony. And Luther, as you know, was a Saxon, and uh, he, I believe, was influenced by the uh, Hussites, indirectly by Wycliffe. And mainly, I think too, and I never was able to study that, I think that probably his translation was also influenced by the Tepel Bible, a German translation before Martin Luther, uh, done by the Hussites, who were influenced by Wycliffe. And some of the typical readings of um, the King James are coming from Luther, and I think he might have gotten them indirectly through the Hussites through, by Wycliffe. So there is a definite connection between Wycliffe, John Huss, and Martin Luther. Right. Well, I'm assuming it was Rome that dug his body up and had right. it. Right. was Rome. What, what part of England was he from, Derek? He used to be in Oxford. Oxford? Yeah, it was in Leicestershire. Okay, thank you, Roger. Just, just. Okay. So, continuing here, you see. Uh, in Germany, the Jesuits started to attack the uh, Greek New Testament text by uh, a series of guys. You have Griesbach here, Lachmann, and they're all unsaved German rationalists, uh, great philologists, meaning uh, theologians, so people who are great linguists in languages, especially Greek and Latin, and they apply the principles of studying a uh, Latin or Greek uh, ancient text, the same principles, to the New Testament text, which you can never do because uh, the New Testament is an inspired book of God, but you can never use uh, the principles, the same principles for a simple secular book to an inspired book. Tregellus was an Englishman and uh, did his work in England. Uh, he was a saved guy from the Open Brethren. Then Tischendorf did a, a, an enormous amount of damage because he was the one who took the second witness Seneca Sinaiticus and pick it up from Mount Sinai from a wastebasket in a St. Catherine a monastery. Uh, too bad he didn't come a few days later because the monks were ready to burn the whole thing there. And he picked it up from the wastebasket and uh, that is the second witness beside Fredicanus. And as you know, when you have two witnesses, then the thing is established, the Bible says. So since 1870, uh, the idea of a new Greek New Testament has come up thanks to Tischendorf. Uh, all four at Wesker and Hort uh, had to do their job in England, and especially Wesker and Hort are instrumental in replacing the authorized version from the minds and the hearts of the students and pastors and, mi and ministers, um, and uh, they take the uh, revised version, which is nothing more than an Alexandrian, Roman Catholic, Jesuit piece of trash, uh, instead of the pure words of God in the authorized version. In Germany, Nestle was the, the, the word there since 1898, and today you have Nestle Aslan's Greek New Testament in 2008, more than 110 years later. So you see that this very small amount of about 45 manuscripts form the basis of basically all the new Bibles since around 1880 in English speaking language, more than 230 up till today. While the other side, uh, is, uh, so the King James side uh, is backed up by more than 5,500 manuscripts up to today. And there's only 45 for Alexandrian texts. Only 45 for Alexandrian uh, yeah, uh, manuscripts within a, a corrupted text. Now this is what uh, <coughs> they try to tell you, what is the <laughs> Greek New Testament, one of the most corrupt things in the world. The United Bible Society, which has its main uh, office in New York City, uh, the fourth revised edition. And um, what it is, it is nothing else than a rehash of the fourth, third century corruptions from Egypt, the top of the world, Alexandria, and uh, based upon a 1% Minority text 
the less than 45 manuscripts. That's all there is to it. And most of these readings are from the oldest and worst manuscripts. Well, they're not even the oldest, neither the best. They're the worst, and they're from uh, uh, b uh, manuscripts containing the Apocrypha. Now, here is, for instance, in Nessel Owens' New Testament, uh, the majority text, so when you see the, the, the M there, right there, that means the, in the textual apparatus, the M means the majority, and they don't, they cannot say which uh, manuscripts cover that, but here you see the majority is these, all these manuscripts have the readings of, in general, the King James text. So each one of them is a manuscript. Each, each of them is a manuscript. That's they, right. they number them right when they find them. Yeah, they, they give them a number to know exactly which uh, number corresponds to which um, kind of manuscript. Hmm. Okay. And uh, this is an example of the guys who put it together. This is the so called D Greek New Testament. And it's done in the tradition of Eberhard Nessel, Aaron Nessel, to apostate uh, a lot of Germans. Edited by Kurt Alland from Münster, a Roman Catholic area, Matthew Black from St. Andrews, Carlo Martini from the Pontifical Biblical Institute from Rome, Jesuit trained, Bruce Metzger from Princeton, and Al Weber from Chicago. And here you see her name, Barbara Alland. Uh, Kurt is dead now, Barbara followed, followed him up. Okay. So a woman is in charge now of letting you know which words of God uh, are for you and which are not for you there. Thank you. And this is uh, the Trinity and Bible that it publishes, also a text called um, the Greek text in the line, English authorized version. We're going to see in a minute that is not the truth. We're going to maybe discuss it tomorrow and give you a whole lot of other readings. There's the authorized readings in particular places do not have in this New Testament a, um, a specific word or letter underlying the uh, authorized version, which means there is not the Greek text as they claim to be. It's very important to know. It's an eclectic text, meaning that there are different manuscripts used to make the um, uh, authorized version. Now, I'm going to discuss the rest of the time with a couple of quotes from Westman and Ward, who, according to the university ideas, uh, are very sound conservative Anglican priests or bishops, or uh, I think one of the archbishops, but they are absolute heretics. They are lost on their way to hell. They are in, in hell right now. That's very important to know. Now here are a few quotes they wrote. This is a quote by Hort and B. F. Westcott, Introduction to the Greek New Testament. Quote, little is gained by speculating as to the precise point at which such corruptions came in. Oh, it is? How about 2 Corinthians 2, 17 in the Authorized Version? It's 55 AD. Mm -hmm. They may be due to the original writer. They say, what they say is, <coughs> God made a mistake by using John or Paul or Peter, and they already had uh, mistakes in the original words God gave. That's what they say. Or to his amendment, because you know Paul many times quotes, and the other somebody else, Silas, he writes it down. If he wrote from dictation, or they may be due to one of the earliest transcribers. So in this way, it shows they deny the uh, divine inspiration or preservation of God's <laughs> words, although God Himself says He will do it. They thought these two guys, Westcott and Hort, uh, the New Testament was like any other book. They wrote, quote, from the introduction to the Greek New Testament, the principles of criticism explained in the foregoing section hold good for all ancient texts, preserved in a plurality of documents in dealing with the text of the New Testament, no new principle, whatever is needed or legitimate. In other words, you can study a old writing of Caesar the same way as the New Testament. That's wrong. Uh, when you discuss the New Testament, you assume you speak about uh, people who study that are born again, 
they assume that the book is inspired, has God's breath on it, and God is able to preserve his words. So that's a completely different way of looking at things than and some kind of a writing done by an uh, unsafe person on, on the basis of secular principles. You cannot apply the principles of a, a secular uh, uh, work to, this, to the principles to, uh, connected with the New Testament. That's impossible. But for them, the New Testament is just an ordinary book. It was not divinely inspired or divinely preserved at all. So what they do, they take these parts of the New Testament, these 45 manuscripts, which more or less are lost for the body of Christ 1,500 years. About the infallibility of Holy Scripture, Westcott writes, 5th of May 1860, quote, my dear heart, for I too must disclaim setting forth infallibility in the front of my convictions. At present I find the presumption in favor of the absolute truth, what should that be? I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scripture overwhelmingly. That's written by Arthur Westcott, the son of B.F. Westcott, in his Life and Letters of B.F. Westcott, 41, page 207. I take all the references. You still can get these uh, through the library long and look it up. And it shows you that these people were the most radical persons of our great hands on a Bible. Westcott doubt the biblical miracles. He writes in 1847, quote, I never read an account of a miracle, but I seem instinctively to feel its improbability and discover some want of evidence in the account of it. Well, that's the language of an unsaved man who was never born again, because the greatest miracle in the, in the world right now is you being born again, great corruptible seed, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In both... Uh, both their sons, Ward and Westcott, wrote two volume biographies of their fathers. There's one uh, account of their being born again or repenting of their sin by trusting the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's not to be found anywhere. And these are the ones uh, we will see uh, has, have made the principles, textual principles, the Greek text and the English text for all the new versions up to 2008 are more than 230. That's where you go by. Now here we have Westcott's denial of Genesis 1 to 3 as literal history, which is very important when it comes to salvation. And this is, of course, what all the New Age, including the Roman Catholic Church uh, leaders, believe. He writes in 1890, in the Archbishop of Canterbury, No one know, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, gives a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. You know what he says there? He says there that he doesn't believe he is a fallen creature. He believes he still has God's image. That's why he doesn't need to be born again and trust Jesus Christ. That's what the Pope says too. That's what Muhammad said, what Buddha says, all the religions basically say. Here we have uh, Wesler's denial of the resurrection of the flesh, which is a very important thing, because if you deny that, you take out, like any good Muslim, the heart of the gospel. Uh, here we read from Curse of Lake's Immortality in the Modern Mind. Until the middle of the 19th century, 1850, opinion in England maintained the same position as Catholic theologians. They held uncompromisingly to the opinion demanded by the Apostles' Creed and affirmed the resurrection of the flesh. Bishop Westcott is really the author of the great change. He entirely abandoned belief in the resurrection of the flesh as formulated in the Creed. But he never said so. On the contrary, he used all his matchless powers of shading language so that the change from white to black appeared. Inevitable, natural, uh, indeed, scarcely perceptible. He writes, for instance, in History of Faith, I believe in the resurrection of the flesh, the flesh of which we speak as destined to a resurrection is not that material substance which we can see and handle, 
measured by properties of sense. Thus he explained that uh, what does it say there? where the creed spoke of the resurrection of the body, it did not mean the resurrection of the flesh, but it was affirming the survival of personal identity. Now, I understand that some of you have a hard time understanding this, but this is typical of the modern theologians. They use the same words we use, resurrection and salvation, but they don't mean the same things when they use these words. It's a play of words. And we're going to discuss uh, next hour about the, how the King James Bible defines words. Uh, that's very important because all the main uh, theological Greek and Hebrew lexicons do the same thing. They redefine a word. So you use a word as a born again Bible here, but an other person doesn't believe the same thing or mean the same thing when he uses that word. That's the problem there. And Westford, of course, is a master in that kind of game. Here we have Hort, and uh, Hort, his buddy, was not safe or traditional at all in his theology. He writes in 1872, he was a professor at that time, can you imagine how blind people were in these days already? A, a guy who was a professor of divinity, more than 130 years ago, who was a, a hell-bound sinner, and, and in these days even, the people didn't know it, the students didn't know it. He speaks, uh, I wrote to warn him that I was not safe or traditional in my theology and that I would not give up association with heretics and such like. But after a single question, he made no difficulty. No. He admits that he is uh, heretical in his own uh, beliefs and he has friends with heretics, people who deny the work and the person of Jesus Christ. Horst denials after the availability of the New Testament. He writes in 1860, uh, 20 plus years before the New Testament comes out, which he worked on, if you make a decided conviction of the absolute infallibility of the New Testament, practically a sine qua non for a cooperation, I feel I could not join you. In other words, if that's the condition you make to work on the New Testament, I cannot join you. Well, that's what he said before already. He said, well, the original writers already have made mistakes in when they wrote the words down, or the ones that monumentous who helped them to write the words down. Here we have, uh, again, Hoare denying the absolute availability of a canonical writing. He writes to Westford in 1860, but I'm not able to go as far as you in asserting the absolute availability of a canonical writing. In other words, uh, a book in our Bible he believes uh, in the original or in the preservation of the words to be fallible. So there are mistakes in that uh, book or in the preservation of that book. Well, that's what any Muslim believes as well. But the, only, the only difference, and I keep on saying that, between a fundamentalistic Muslim, a good Muslim, and Western Horde is just the amount of stuff they leave out is inspired in the New Testament. The Muslims are just a little bit more honest. <laughs> they, they say, well, Jesus Christ was never historically crucified and never rose from the dead. That's what they say. The Bishop and Hort say too, but in more shady language that we need to remember. Now, Hort denied that the literal Genesis 4 item was reasonable. He writes in 1886. The authors of the article doubtless assume the strictly historical character of the account of the fallen Genesis. This assumption is now, in my belief, no longer original. But the early chapters of Genesis remain a divinely appointed parable or epilogue setting forth important practical truths or subjects which, as a matter of history, lie outside our present canon. Well, that's the whole idea of uh, archaeological discoveries, they always try to prove that the Bible has historical mistakes. Why? Because the Bible is first of all a history book, not a religious book. It gives history in time and space a matter of God dealing with human beings and it is not first of all religious at all. So that's what Hort denies here. Now, of course, he goes further and he denies a literal Garden of Eden. And literal fall of Adam. He writes in 1848, I am inclined to think that no such state as Eden 
I mean the popular notion, ever existed and that Adam's fall in no degree differs from the fall of each of his descendants, as Corwitz justly argues. In other words, he says, I don't believe I lost God's image, I still have God's image. That's why I don't need to repent and get born again by faith in a literal, visible, resurrected Jesus Christ. That's what he says. But he doesn't uh, write it down or say it in these words. That's what he said. That's what the Pope says. That's why all the big religious today, religious today can get together because they all deny that we have, uh, we have lost God's image. We are completely in sin. And all religions say you do not need to be born again by faith in God manifest in the flesh. Now, of course, Darwin came up with his junk in the same time, so what happens there? It's very important to note. Uh, here we see what Hort held to the truth of Darwin's origin of the species. He writes to Westcott in 1860, quote, Have you read Darwin? How I should like to talk with you about it. In spite of difficulties, I'm inclined to think it unanswerable. In any case, it is a treat to read such a book. Well, why do you why do you like that? Because if you come from if a man comes from from species or from an amoeba or some kind of animal there, hey, he is not created by God, he has to have to answer before holding a righteous God. And he is just like a, 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 a being, a, an animal being there. Uh, he is nothing more, and certainly he's not made in God's image. Well, Darwin said the same thing when it comes to the origin of the species as Western Hoare did when it came to preservation of the Word of God. They both say uh, everything gets better and better in time. Well, we know, according to the first and second law of thermodynamics, we discussed the first night, everything gets worse, it falls to pieces, entropy. Well, that's the same thing you see in the Bible. When God starts something in Eden, man messes it up. God starts with Abram, he messes it up. He starts in Israel, they end up in Babylon and Assyria there. God starts with the local church, and they are ending up with a Bibio Apostasio, a divorced apostle Bible. What's going to assume that the best Bibles come up at the end of the church age? Like Dharma says, we, the, the best people, uh, human, animals come up at the end of the line of uh, uh, evolution, which is nuts. It only degenerates in life, if you have any common sense, when you want to be scientific. So, Ward and Westcott love Darwin because Darwin did the same in evolution as it did in manuscript evidence. And what you also see with these two guys, they never see that Satan had his hand in Bible corruption at a single time in uh, 2,000 years of history. Well, they wrote about the uh, Greek Vatican manuscript B. We learn next that B, the manuscript of the Pope, very far exceeds all other documents in neutrality of text, as measured by the above tests, being in fact always or nearly always neutral. Well, neutral, what, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. I know one thing, though, in war, and there is a war going on about the souls of man, and it's over the Word of God, neutral soldiers are the worst enemy uh, you can have. When a soldier refuses to fight in time of war, he gets court-martialed and shot on the spot. Amen? Well, that's what you have right now. Thanks to this neutral text, you have a whole bunch of born-again Christians in Great Britain who refuse to stand up for the pure word of God and refuse to actively win souls for Jesus Christ. And that's the manuscript of the Man of Sin in Rome. Western Hort believed that when Vatican, B, and Sinai, Aleph agreed it was the text of the autographs. But the fullest comparison does but increase the conviction that there, B, and Aleph, Relatively, purity is likewise approximately absolute. Approximately absolute, that's a contradiction anyway. A true approximate reproduction of the text of the autographs. That's what I believe. Well, I can be true approximate indeed. But see, it is, they, they need two witnesses. On the moment the Tishinov in 1870 discovered Sinaiticus Aleph, 
They have two completely corrupt manuscripts, which contradict only the Gospels more than 3,000 times, and they have two things which don't agree together, but they agree together against 99% of the manuscript evidence, against the authorized version text. And that's why Western Hort loved these two corrupt manuscripts so much and call them pure and neutral. We call them devil-inspired and absolutely corrupt. Amen. Now, it's very important to understand these things. Why? Here we have Hoske. He writes, the text printed by Weskin and Hort in 1870-1884 has been accepted as the true text and grammars, works on a synoptic problem, works on higher criticism, and others have been grounded on this text, which is the truth. That's why we take these two guys and show, by their fruit you shall know them, they were unsaved rationalists who are now in hell, and that's why their work is at the same uh, quality, it's not even neuter, it is just absolutely negative. Uh, the textual theories of Weskin and Hort underlies virtually all subsequent work in New Testament textual criticism since more than 100 years. So, since 100 years, England is on the, on the way down. Before the British Empire went down after the First World War, morally, inwardly, the thing went down, and it started in London, the same place where uh, the authorized version was made about uh, 300 years before. Another text, another quote here, the two most popular manual editions of the Greek text today, Nassau's Aland and the United Bible Society, a text really varied little from the West Korean War text. A quote by Wilbur Pickering, that's a boarding and fellow who stands for the majority text. Uh, he had a, a question to Mr. Metzger, he was one of the guys who was on the committee uh, of five of uh, the Nassau Aland uh, Greek New Testament. And uh, Metzger writes, quote, we took as our base at the beginning the text of Western and Hort, 1881, and introduced change as seemed necessary on the base of manuscript evidence. So this is a very plain quote of a guy who worked actually as a Princeton professor on these uh, couple of manuscripts, on his new uh, testament text for all the new versions. The two Greek manuscripts followed by anti text receptive people from the time of Western of Hort until now. Following the theories of Weskin and Horton in about 1881 AD, modern day anti receptus people follow and almost worship chiefly two fourth century manuscripts, the Vaticanus, manuscript B, and the Sinai manuscript Aleph. Putting them together, you have B and Aleph, Baal, Baal worshippers. And uh, we don't have the quotes in that, but both Weskin and Hort uh, lean toward Mariolatry and sacerdotalism, meaning you need a priest to uh, get the body of Christ, who changes the bread into the flesh of Christ, and you only need to get to Mary before we can get to Jesus Christ. Both have a tendency. Here we have Dean Bergen, the greatest champion of the Greek New Testament text from England. And he says concerning B and Aleph, uh, they, the mistakes, are chiefly omissions, of one, two, or three words, but sometimes of half a verse, or whole verse, or even several verses. I hesitate not to assert that it would be easier to find a folio containing three or four such omissions than to light on one which should be without any. And in the Gospels alone, Codex B leaves out words or whole clauses no less than 1,491 times. And this guy, uh, uh, actually collated a few of the big manuscripts. Western Hort never did that. This guy did it and spent years of his life fighting for the uh, reintroduction of the Receptus and Authorized Version text in England. And he refuted Western Hort completely in a couple of articles. And uh, they have been reprinted in a book called The Revision Revised. It's still reprinted, but hardly anybody takes the time to read it. And they hardly can be found in university libraries up till today. Dean Bergen has this to say, and yet the codex in question, this is Aleph, abounds with errors of the iron pen to an extent not unparalleled 
that happily rather unusual in documents of first-rate importance. This state of the text of Aleph as proceeding from the first scribes may be regarded as very rough. Is then the manuscript authority to be confounded with editorial caprice exercising itself upon the corrections of at least ten different revisers? <laughs> who from the 6th to the 12th century had been endeavoring to lick and to shape a text which in its original author left very rough. I said to Brother Derek, you know, I thought about four or five, but they had about 10 different revisers after the first uh, rough edition in the 4th century. Oskay writes, it is high time the bubble of Codex B should be pricked. Uh, I had thought that time would cure the extraordinary Horsian heresy. I seemed to write a consecutive account of the crooked path pursued by manuscript B, which from ignorance I throw most people still confused with purity and neutrality. I present therefore an indictment against the manuscript B and against West Cranhort, subdivided in hundreds of separate counts. I now throw some bombs into the inner citadel. It is because from that keep there continues uh, till the issue a large amount of ignorance, uh, iteration of Hort's conclusion without one particle of proof that the foundation theory is correct. Over 3,000 real difference between Aleph and uh, B are recorded in the Gospels alone. This guy, letter for letter, collated the Vatican manuscript. And these proofs are to be found in a book called Codex B and its Allies. And hardly anybody takes the time today to look upon it, it's hardly uh, able to be found. Now, what are the results of this Western Nord corruption of the Greek New Testament text? Here it is. The Receptus has about 140,000 and something words. It's 647 pages, about 217 words per page. The Western Horde changes in the receptors are in 5,604 places that conclude 9,970 words. This is 15.5 words per page. That is 7% of the word that is 45.9 pages. You say, well, that's only 7% of the words. Well, if you give your baby food, which is 7% uh, corrupted or, or bad or poisoned, the little thing dies. And if you look now after 120 years, how the state of the body of Christ is here in Great Britain, it's absolutely shot, it's poisoned. And think about it, it was so bad anyway already, 120 years ago, that I couldn't even discern the corruption and the stupidity of the argument of Western Horde. So how do you think it is now? Now, what is 9,970 words in the English Bible? It is about the entire book of Romans, or the entire book of 1 Corinthians, or you can say six, the book of Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, Philemon, 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude. These words have been changed, subtracted, and added from God's word in the Western Horde Greek New Testament text. And that's a lot of words. Which means that that counts the same even more for the new Bibles like the Good News Bible and uh, this and this. Not only that, 2,886 words are missing in modern Greek texts. Jack Moore, I think he's now a pastor in London, he writes uh, wrote a book called Missing in Modern Bibles and the Full Story Being Told. And he counted every word in the received Greek text and compared with the Miss Allen Greek text. And he said, um, uh, the uh, Nessalon text is shorter than the received text by 2,886 words. That is 934 words more than were omitted from the West Korean Horde text. They only omitted 1,952 words. So you see, West Korean Horde started to change the words uh, around 1884, and Nessalon did it about 100 years later, and they threw out another almost 1,000 words. See there? It only gets worse. It never gets better. There's only more hatred shown in the course of time against the pure words of God. Um, I'll do this one. Um, 
procedure. This is might be a little help for you guys as a summary. There are here 37 historical links uh, supporting the received texts. The Apostolic Churches used to receive texts between 33 and 100 AD. Then the Church in Palestine, the Syrian Church in Antioch, the Peshitta Syriac version in 150 AD, Papyrus 66 and Magdalene Papyrus uh, around 60 AD used to receive uh, text. Then you have the Italy Church in Northern Italy, 157 AD, used to receive kind of text. Later, the Waldensians settled there in the same area in the northwest of Italy, um, northwest of uh, Torino. Then the Gallic Church of Southern France, where the Albigensians lived, 177 AD used that text. The Celtic Church in Great Britain, the Church of Scotland and Ireland, with especially Columba and St. Pat, used that kind of text in uh, the Old Latin and translations from that. The pre Waldensian churches in the Dark Ages, and we mentioned their names yesterday, used to receive kind of text. The Waldensians, uh, 120 AD plus, especially after 1200 AD, used that kind of text. The Gothic version, made by Euphilus from the 4th century, used the, kind of, uh, the King James text. Codex W of uh, Matthew in the 4th and 5th century used the context. Codex A in the Gospels, only the Gospels in the 5th century, that's the right text. And the vast majority of extant New Testament manuscripts all used to receive text. That's 99%, um, or more than 5,000 of these manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And they all underlie the King James Authorized Version. The Greek Orthodox Church still uses this same kind of text. And uh, all the churches in the Reformation used this text. It was Erasmus, Greek New Testament text 1516, the Confrontation of Polyglot, made by uh, Cardinal Ximenes in Alcala, Luther's German Bible, 1st of September Testament 1522, then his whole Bible 1534, William Tyndale's text 1525, French version of the Tongue 1534, Coverdale, Matthew Bible, 1537, had all the same kind of text, and for that text, thousands upon thousands of people literally gave their lives. Not a single time they gave their lives for this corrupt text from Alexandria, Egypt. Taverner's Bible, 1539, the Great Bible, 1538, uh, 39, Stephen's Greek Testament text, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Spanish version by Valera, the Bedsa Greek Testament, 1598, the Czech version, the Italian version by Diodati, 1607, and the King James text, and from the Elsevier Brothers in the Netherlands, uh, published in 1624. And uh, that's the text of the authorized version 1611. It's the text you can absolutely rely on. Now, this is a little summary there of New Testament manuscripts there. Uh, we we'll discussed them before. Uh, you have, as witnesses, this is about uh, numbers of about 1995. Um, the total is about 5,255 different papyrus, which are small pieces of uh, papyrus from the Nile River in Egypt. Junchos, block capital manuscripts uh, to the 7th, 8th century. Cursefs uh, from the 8th, 9th century on lectionaries, the reading in the churches. And then you have here behind it how many of them are West Grand Horde readings, and then in percentage, uh, how many of them are West Grand Horde readings. And you see most of them are papyrus which are West Coast Horde readings because they are all from Egypt, close to Alexandria. And all everything total, you see that less than 1% is West Coast Horde Alexandrian type. Mostly, 99%, it is your authorized version New Testament text. Uh, here are the new figures from uh, 2000, and, uh, 2000, Cambridge University Press by G.K. Elliott. And you have then, eight years ago, there were 5,695 manuscripts. All the new ones, as far as I know, I have a um, Antiochian King James character, not a uh, Alexandrian character. All right, I think I should leave it here so far. And uh, ask you if there are any questions so far in what we discussed. Any questions? Any? Take these references. Uh, a couple of these references are typical for the authorized version, not only for the Greek text underlying the authorized version. 
Um, we discussed a few of them, uh, like uh, the infallible proofs about the resurrection of Christ, that there's many which corrupt the word of God, confessing your faults one to another, um, despise of those that are good in the last days, still to show yourself approved unto God, uh, science falsely so gold, love of money is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy 6, 10, uh, the deity of Jesus Christ as holy child, Jesus in Acts 4, Acts 2, about Jesus Christ's soul going to hell. These things have nothing to do with the Greek text, but have to do with how the, any Greek text is translated into English, the Greek in general is just the same. Now, you can, we, we can cover them later. I want to say something, uh, because uh, on, my, on, my, on, my, on my call, the Greek receptus freaks, <laughs> that is a, a movement now, since the last 50 years coming up from the United States of America, uh, mainly because the King James Bible and preaching teacher are hitting hard the uh, uh, apostate uh, Alexandrians. And what the Alexandrians do now, they shift back from the corrupt uh, texts, Greek texts from Alexandria to those of Antioch. So they say, well, we're going to go also with the Greek textus receptus, the received text. And you may think that, well, they only use the King James Bible, and they believe the Greek textus receptus. But in general, they're not Bible believers. What we mentioned, Bible is, Bible is a book. So when you say, I'm a Bible believer, you believe uh, this book, it's obviously the King James Bible, yeah? <laughs> this book to be the absolute written authority in English language. But when you speak, when somebody says, I'm a Greek receptus believer, the Greek receptus is just a part of the Bible. It's not the whole Bible. Uh, what they are trying to do now is in Holland and England, they're going to put out a Greek receptus, the right Greek text, with a Hebrew Old Testament together in one book. But it's still in two different languages, most people cannot read. So, <clears throat> the trouble though with these people is they betray themselves. I'm going to give you here a list of ten references, you can copy them later if you want. And the thing is, today, if you want to get yourself a uh, Greek New Testament of the received text, it's mainly Berries or Scriveners. It's an American lesson Englishman. And the King James is not always, um, or these Greek New Testaments are not always word for word underlying the King James text, as they pretend to be. Especially by those who say we are Greek receptus freaks. For instance, in Mark 14, 43, uh, the word being is omitted in the King James text, but is there in Barry's and Scrivener's Greek New Testament? In John 7, 9, the word and is omitted in the King James 16, 11 text, but it is there in Barry's and Scrivener's uh, Greek New Testament text. In John 10, 16, it says twice, one fold. The second time, one fold is changed to one flock in these Greek New Testament. Acts 2.22, it is approved or set forth. The King James says approved, the New Testament of these guys say set forth. Acts 6.3, the King James say we may appoint, the Greek Testament say we will appoint. That's important. Every word of God we discussed yesterday right. is given by God. Acts 17.30, this ignorance, the word this is changed to it and just omitted in the Greek New Testament. Acts 19.20, the word of God is in the King James text, but is changed to the word of the Lord in these two Greek New Testaments. In Acts 26, 6, our fathers in the King James is changed to the fathers in these two Greek New Testaments. And 1 Corinthians 6 and 23, our Lord in the King James is changed to the Lord in the New Testament there. And finally, Colossians 1.24, uh, the authorized version starts with who, and the Greek New Testament starts with now. now you have here about ten references, and you say to them, okay, you believe the King James Bible is uh, the Word of God? Oh yeah, they say. But we go to the Greek. I say, okay, well, if you go to the Greek, that Greek has to underline the King James, right? Right. Well, it doesn't underline the King James in at least ten places. So what is right? Well, then I have to choose. Either the authorized version is right, or that Greek text is right. And that be the God, they will have the ones who decide. So they do the same thing 
This time using the receptors, as the guys from Alexandrian manuscripts do, using their Alexandrian manuscripts, because they are still the same God. They still decide with their brain what are the words of God for you. It's not a text in English that everybody can understand. You understand that? So to always try to stay still away the authorized versions from you using not anymore the Alexandrian manuscripts, but the Antiochian Greek New Testament text. Mm. That's the idea. As long as you, your faith in the English book is destroyed, it doesn't matter really what you use. Which Greek text you use? But this is the authority. This is the book of God for the English speaking book. That's the only thing I want you to know there, and you can copy them later, a little later there. Um, let's leave it up here. And let's uh, continue now with the uh, last part of the building dictionary in the New King James Bible. Okay, let's get the lights back. Yeah, show them all down. I'm not sure, there might be a problem there. Let's see if it comes by you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, all I need yeah. is just place it on. Put it in the yeah. Okay, we have to we'll see where it goes. Put the table back up too. I don't know if I need the camera. Well, let's just see what it does or not. We can also put a little bit forward in the last. Do you want to put the uh, thing back on the uh, table? I want to see what he wanted to do. Did it. Uh... I think we'll put a little bit forward if you want. Oh, I want to? Pull it forward? You can put it back. Look at this whole thing forward, probably. Oh, okay. All right, the Bible's building dictionary. Um, to uh, keep it sitting on the table in the mirror. So you can drop that leg down. Some good stuff here, guys. Well, this is a, there isn't a real meat for you guys because I know a lot of stuff has been going a lot. Some of the stuff may be going over your head, but some of you guys may already know something of it. Uh, this helps you a lot to do Bible study without the help of any Greek, English, or Hebrew dictionary. Um, a close examination of the thousand most difficult words in the King James Version reveals that God defines all of them. First in their context, secondly in their first usage, and thirdly by using the very words that are used in the Oxford English Dictionary, it's about 26 volumes, or Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And it's available in the King James Bible's Building Dictionary by Gil Ripley. So I think I saw a copy laying around here, otherwise you're passing to get a copy of that. 
Right. It's worthwhile to get in. I have a bigger CD with about 180 pictures on it, but that's just too much. I think in one hour you get most of the material, and I hope you start to check it out for yourself. For instance, the first step is look at the words next to the word in question, the word abroad. In the Oxford uh, Dictionary, it means widespread. We see in Genesis 10, 18, spread abroad. A verse, the word means, in Webster's, this word has the idea of from. Micah 2, 8, a verse from war. Adamant, Webster's defines it as a very hard stone. Ezekiel 3, 9 says, an adamant harder than flint. Zechariah 7, 12, an adamant stone. So you see, God normally reinforces the, what he called the difficult word by using a similar word you know, and then use it basically twice so it gets in your mind and at the same time defines a more difficult word. Now if you can't find the word directly before or after the word is used, look at the words in the verse itself. For instance, an adder. Webster defines it as a serpent. Genesis 49, 17 says, a serpent by the way, an adder. A thirst. Webs uh, defines it as thirsty. Judges 15, 18, he was sore. A thirst. Shall I die of thirst? So in the same verse, the word is defined. Bism. Um, oh, the Oxford Dictionary says, to sweep with force. I will sweep it with the besom of destruction. So God knows the fragile human mind. If you can't find it in the same verse or before or after the word, you go to words next or preceding the word where it is used. The word betwixt, for instance. Oxford defines it as between. Genesis 17, verse 10 and 11, we read, between me and you, betwixt me and you. So it reinforces, reiterates it again with another word. A four, Oxford Dictionary says before, 2 Kings 20, verse 3 and 4, walked before, pass before. December, not easy. Oxford Dictionary says deceive or cover. Proverbs 26, 23, 24, 25, 26, we read lips like a pot shirt covered, dissembleth with his lips, and layeth up deceit, believe him not, covered by deceit. So in the verse before and after, the word dissembling is defined as deception or covering. Describe, Oxford Dictionary says to get sight of, to espy, to spy out. Judges 1, 23, 24, 25, we read, Joseph sent to describe Bethel. The spies saw a man, they said, show us, who will show thee, he showed them. The fourth step, if you can't, it is the first three steps, begin reading at the paragraph mark, then read through the whole chapter. For instance, the word abated. All dictionaries give these surrounding words the same meaning as abated, to lessen. In Genesis 8, 1 to 5, we read the waters as washed, fountains stopped, rain restrained, waters returned, waters were abated, waters decreased. So in five words, you have about four or five different other words for the term abated. Now then, what you have a lot of time, people say, well, there are these archaic words used in 1611, nobody uses them anymore. Mm -hmm. For instance, the word prevent. Now, if you know a little Latin there, by the way, you know people, if you have a chance to learn a couple of years of Latin, it helps you a lot to understand the English language, and especially the Latin languages, French, German, and uh, Italian. Pre means before. Vent is from the French vedir, uh, for the Latin vedir, to come. So prevent means to come before. Now the reference is in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, we which are alive and remain, and to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. But the New King James and NIV say precede. 
Now, then comes from Latin word venir, which means to come. Seed comes from Latin word sede, which means to go away, to withdraw. Yeah. Virginia succeeded from the union, mm -hmm. went away from the union. <laughs> so, from God's perspective, we are coming. But the only way Christians would be going and not coming is if the person was looking at it from a lost person's perspective. Meaning the perspective of the translation companies of the New King James and the NIV. For them we go away. For God we come home. Now when they say, oh, about all these deeds and doubts. That's just okay stuff now. Uh, in, in 1611, people didn't even use in the normal language the and thou. But the translators put it in there anyway. Why was that? Although many uh, do not realize it, the and ye are easily understood. It is amazing to know that the play Romeo and Julia had just as many archaic words as the King James Version. And no one seems to have a problem understanding. Nobody says, well, we have to update uh, Shakespeare's language because the the and thou is not is too archaic. One stick T words are singular, and the double broken stick Y words or the, the Y words are plural. So the nominative, the King James says thou, is from the German du, and the NFV has you. The King James is ye in the plural form, and the German has ihr. So in German there is a difference, it's a Germanic language where English is originally from. In du, thou, singular, and plural, ihr or ye. But the NIV has both views. You never know if it's a singular or plural person which is addressed. Okay. The objective there is in the King James, the, and uh, you in the plural, and the NIV has just you. A possessive adjective is in the King James in the singular, thy, Thy word, the King James, the plural is your words. But the NIV is both your, you don't see a difference in it. And the possessive pronoun it is thine, it is, uh, the, word, the, the word which is the book, is, it's, which is thine, or which is yours, you see the addressed person in your singular or plural. Not to be seen in the NIV. Now, why is it so important? Look at John 3 7. Marvel not that I say unto you, Sorry, let us say unto thee, ye must be born again. Notice here how Jesus phrases salvation. Marvel not that I say unto thee, that's singular, this tells Nicodemus that Jesus is speaking directly to him. Ye must be born again. Now this tells Nicodemus that this requirement is the same for every person that is a sinner. Now this addresses the the of Nicodemus and changes that to the ye to the reader right now reading the word of God beside Nicodemus. The reader plus Nicodemus is ye, plural. Yeah. New versions say, You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. I guess that shows that it was just for Nicodemus, not for the one reading it. Uh -huh. Now, did you know that the first ye in the Bible was given by Satan? Did you know that God never said, Ye shall not eat of the tree? And did you know that God never told Eve that she, she could not eat of the tree? Did you know that Satan is not as stupid as we human we Christians are? Did you know that by changing one word, Satan changed the meaning of God's message? And did you know that is exactly what Satan has done in the modern versions? You miss all of these details in all modern versions. God deals with an individual soul on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis. In Genesis 2 we read, God said, Thou shalt not eat of it. In Genesis 3, the serpent said, Ye shall not eat of every tree. Ye shall not surely die. Ye shall be as God. Genesis 3, 9 we read, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Hast thou eaten of the tree? God addressed the male. The snake addressed the female and the male, but the male addressed the, the female first. Now the reason clamor about so-called inclusive language, 
we're going to talk about inclusive language. That's about the idea of that you take out the uh, uh, mainly the male gender in the bottle. Uh, it, is, it is a smoke screen hiding the fact that the NIV has since its introduction in 1973 omitted male pronouns like he and him. Not only was lesbian Virginia Mollencott a stylist, but the chairman of the Old Testament Committee, Martin Waldstra, that's a Frisian, was according to the homosexual group evangelicals concerned their friend. In order to emasculate the Bible, these editors must change 1,732 Greek singers to English plurals like they and them. When this is done, the Bible loses its focus on the individuals and transfers it to the church. Of course, this matches precisely what the false doctrine being taught in many of today's churches. The EA church membership is equivalent to salvation of the Catholics. When the singular words, he and him, are replaced with they and them, the messianic prophecy disappears. Psalm 3420 then has no reference to Christ at all. Other versions, like the uh, New Revised Standard Version, CUV, NCV, and New Living Translation, are wholly gender inclusive. They omit Father no less than 601 times, mm. Son no less than. Uh, 181 times, he and him no less than 3,408 times. The current NIV omits the word man 863 times. And the King James alone echoes the Greek and Hebrew genders precisely. Now here are a couple of examples. The one versus the Holy One. Jeremiah 2.11 Had the nation changed their gods? Yeah, they did anyway, since about 120 years. Changing of the Gods by New Age author Naomi Goldenberg, it's by the Jewish girl, asserts, God is going to change. We women are going to bring an end of it. Mm. Now Luke 10, 16, you read an authorized version, despiseth him. And the NAS read, rejects the one. Not a male anymore. It's a uh, Michael Jackson movie. Yeah. Acts 10 42. It is he, is the King James. The NIV is this is the one. Uh, Colossians 3 10, him, the King James, change it to the image of the one. Now, books like Century Spirituality by a well lesbian NIV editor Virginia Mollencott echo the New Age movement, hopes to replace the he of Christianity with the new one of Hinduism. If you remember in Daniel, we have the reference to the Antichrist there, and he's a male, but he says he will not um, regard, the, regard the love of women, I think. Uh, regard the preference of women or the desire of women. Desire of women, right. So it seems to be some kind of queer or neuter you can't say that. or something else, you know, which is not uh, male, but some neuter thing. Would it be incorrect? You can't say that? Exactly. You're <laughs> politically incorrect, you can't say that. And that his style is author of the pro homosexual books and his spirituality. This uh, Virginia Monocot jabs, my lesbianism has always been a part of me. Ah. Now, it came unto you when you choose for the Conde Romans 1. Mm -hmm. Her other pro homosexual book is The Homosexual My Neighbor. <laughs> echoes her NIV assertion that the Bible censures only criminal offenses like prostitution and violent gang rape, not sincere homosexuals drawn to somebody of the same sex. Now, that, that, that spirit behind it comes back in all the new versions. And the King James Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, effeminate. Yeah, that's right. And the NIV changes that to male prostitutes and their homosexual offenders, which you still can be effeminate, yeah. like most uh, homosexuals are. Yeah. Uh, Sodomites in the King James Bible and Deuteronomy 1 Kings and 2 Kings is changed to shrine prostitutes. No, a sodomite doesn't have to be a shrine prostitute to be a sinner in the eyes of God. Trouble. So what I do is here, the, this lady here covers up her own sin because sodomites is addressed to her and change it so she says, well, I'm not a shrine prostitute, I'm not that bad. Now you are. You're yeah. a sodomite and you just translate the whole thing away. That's, right. That's still the standard. So clear. Now, the sermon was more subtle. We talked about the New King James Bible there, and we will uh, put out some more material probably tomorrow on the chart there. Here's already a whole lot of stuff. 
on why the new King James is not at all a new King James, it's a satanical imitation uh, attacking Jesus Christ the whole of times. For instance, the word Lord is omitted if you compare it with the standard, the authorized version 1611, 66 times. God is omitted 51 times. Heaven is omitted 50 times. Repent, let me think of that word. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 44 times. Blood is a terrible thing, but blood redemption can get saved. He's to be get out 23 times. Hell, of course, is completely politically incorrect, 22 yeah. times. Job misses entirely. New Testament misses entirely. Damnation is completely gone. That's, of course, too negative. And devils is completely gone and changed to demons. Yeah. Why? Because they pick up the Greek philosophical idea there is one devil. And a lot of demons, but in the Greek philosophical idea is demons can also be good spirits. Yeah, that's right. And devils can never be good spirits. Everybody knows that. So look at the connotation also. Evil, devil. Mm. See there? And when you pay change to demon, that whole connotation of evil connected with devils is gone. The New King James Version ignored the Greek text receptors over 1,200 times. So it's not at all based on the Greek receptors. Plus, the New King James replaced the King James Version Hebrew Old Testament Ben Chaim with the corrupt Stuttgart edition Ben Asher. That's a uh, Ben Asher text translating of Genesis, originally from Cairo, Egypt. So, the Old Testament uh, corrupt text is from Egypt, Cairo. And the New Testament uh, text for most new versions is uh, from Alexandria, Egypt. The New King James has a mixture between the uh, Alexandrian and uh, the receptor steps there. Now, the New King James Version also demotes Christ. In Luke 13, 8, the word Lord is changed to Sir. In Matthew 18, 26, the word worshipping him as Lord is gone and is now just Master. That's how Jesus is scared of right? Jesus Christ, the Lord, right. Master. Master. Matthew 20, 20, they were worshipping him, but now in the New King they're just kneeling down. Hmm. Difference. The right hand of power, Matthew 26, 64, is now the right hand of power. With a back capital P there. Power is gone. Uh, like, like the power or the force uh, with Darth Vader there in mm -hmm. Star Wars. In Genesis 22, 8, God will provide himself a lamb. They changed that, that God himself will be the lamb. He, God will provide for himself the lamb. So in this way, God is not himself the lamb anymore who will and provide himself to be offered for the sins of the world. John 1, 29, 1, 2, 3, 16. John 8, 35. The Son changed to a Son. Mm. Jesus Christ is not the only begotten Son of God anymore. Colossians 2, 2. The mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And changed to the mystery of God both of the Father and of Christ. Matthew 19, 16. Good Master changed to a good teacher. A teacher is not the same as a master. He has some rule over you. A teacher doesn't have to be that. He can just impart knowledge. A lot of times, the New King James Bible copies the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. In this case, it demotes Christ. For instance, in Acts 3, 13 and 26, it speaks of his son, Jesus. It's very important. We say that to a Jew. He flips out because the Jew, an Orthodox Jew, believes God has only one son, it's the nation of Israel, it's first begotten. Mm -hmm. uh, as a nation, they call themselves the first begotten son, but as an individual, you can never say that's blasphemy. And that's the reason why the high priest was willing to crucify Jesus Christ when he made, made that statement on the question more about. It. So they changed to servant Jesus. The same in Acts 4, 27 and 30, holy child Jesus to holy servant Jesus, that's not at all. Uh, and um, uh, reproach to a Jew when you say that Jesus was a servant. The firstborn of every creature in Colossians 1.15 is changed to firstborn over all creation. Well, that's not the truth at all. It says, speak, speak, speak about creation, speak about creatures. And he was born there as a man, as a creature, not as a creation. Mark 2.15, the word Jesus completely a minute. Mm -hmm. And he was 4.8 and Acts 7.45. The word Jesus is taken to Joshua because they think it refers to the Old Testament, but that Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, and the Greek word is Jesus himself. Yeah. So that's just private interpretation in the New Testament. Uh, 
um, finally, Acts 23, 5, the patient waiting for Christ is changing the patience of Christ. Now you have, by the grace of God, waiting patiently that Jesus Christ will come back to get you. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with the patience of Christ himself. Now it continues, the New King James, comes the New World Translation, when it comes to the mode of the Trinity. The King James Bible speaks in Acts 17, 29, and Paul said to the Athenians about the Godhead change to the divine nature. Well, that's what all the Hindus believe, that all these gods have the divine natures. Uh, Philippians 4.20, the God and our Father changed to our God and Father. Revelation 1.6, God and His Father changed to His God and Father. Mm -hmm. Now the trouble is, in Revelation 1, speaking of Jesus Christ, He is God and His Father. But here, uh, the New King James changed that to Jesus Christ has his God. He isn't God himself anymore. Mm. It's very subtle, you see that? But if you look uh, carefully, you see the uh, darker implications there. Questions 3.17, God and the Father by him. God and the Father, God the Father through him. And finally, they deny the idea that uh, the Holy Ghost is a person who can comfort, he is just a helper, a, a, a power, mm -hmm. a strength, a force. Mm -hmm. That's the name of the Now, the New King James also covers a New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses when it comes to works of progressive salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says that be followers of Christ, not imitators of Christ. Mm -hmm. The great imitator is uh, the God of his world. Faith in Romans 3, 3 is changed to faithful. Look, that's a work. You have to be faithful in things you do. But faith is something that has nothing to do with works at all. It's exercising faith on the basis of what God says. Revelation Romans 11, 30, not believe it is changed to disobedient, a work. That's all Roman Catholic uh, pagan doctrine works. Romans 11, 32, unbelief, changed to disobedient. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, are saved, you are saved, that's a present state, is now our being saved. Wow. You never know if you're saved at all. You're in the process of being saved. That was, that's what more than a billion Catholics believe. They keep the seven sacraments, and they are being saved, but they have to die in a state of grace. If not, well, they just spend a couple of thousand years in purgatory. But nobody can say, I am saved. 2 Corinthians 2.15, are saved to change in our being saved. I bet you can ask the Joe Witnesses, are, are, you, are you born again? No. Uh, Why well, you say, well, I hope so. Is that the Catholic and Protestant says? Ephesians 2.8, are saved again, change to have being saved. Now here we see the uh, religious tolerance or uh, of the... Um, the little bit like that. The whole thing, you know. Alright. The next uh, 1721 we see that Paul addresses the Athenians as being too superstitious, as most people today have all kind of idols in their heart. We discussed that in the first night in Ezekiel 14. Uh, to the New King James says, Well, you are very religious. No, when you go to India with these 300 million gods, you have superstitious people who worship uh, Idols of stone and metal. That's not the same as fellow religious. So 91, the heathen, that's a name of people who are without God, without God, without Christ, is changed to nations. That's not the same. In Revelation 21, 22, you see the nations which are saved coming to the New Jerusalem. They're not heathen. Acts 25, 19, superstition is changed to religion. It's politically more correct. It's not that negative. That's right. And the, the main trouble there in Acts 24, 14, the heresy. Bible the Christians, indeed, they were called a heresy. And it's changed to a sect. Hmm. Right now, according to the Council of Trent, all of you here are all heretics. Because hmm. you have more than 100 uh, curses placed on your head because you believe to be saved once and for all in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, without baptism, without any work, without any second, without any help of the church or own, then you're a heretic, according to them. Mm -hmm. 
The sick is just a group which is um, separated from another group. The Latin word secar meaning to cut off. It is not the same as heresy at all. Now, the New King James Version covers the New World Translation many of times in pantheism, androgyny, and gender equity. Uh, in Luke 17, 9 and 20, we read in the King James Version, He that should come is now the coming one, is the neuter. Mm -hmm. Is it the male anymore you expect? It's some kind of a uh, female, uh, male mix. In John 17, 18, he and his is neuter, the one. A very important one, John 4, 24, God is a spirit, which means he is separate from his creation. Is now in the pantheistic day, God is stirred, God is in everything. Yeah. That is the idea of the uh, green piece and the tree huggers. You can't uh, put a tree out of your garden, there are your great granddaddy might live in there, but you can't uh, step on an because it might be your great grandmother coming back as an arm there, and you have to protect the environment there. Uh, in spite of the human beings, and these people are willing to kill human beings to preserve nature or animals. That's right. Because God is stirred, He's in everything. You want to know what the result of that is? Look at uh, Hinduism, you know, and go to India for a couple of months and see how great it is there and see if you want to come back or not. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 2.18, person is changed to presence. Mm. Uh, the, the all presence of God and everything. And finally, Genesis 2.18, a help me for him. Guys, you need to help me for you. Is now a helper comparable to you. You don't know, need at all. They can be some kind of queer. A help me is someone who is a help who has some qualities you don't have. But it ought to be comparable at all. That's the typical feminist bunk coming in there. You know, we're all equal, you know, and I can compare myself to you and you to me, and we're all the one and we're all the same. You're not the same. See the thing there? Right. Right. Yeah. Finally, the self-esteem. Oh. Of course, we all are full of self-esteem. We run to love ourselves and hug ourselves and feel good about ourselves. Yes. And we do anything wrong, we say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, in this case, the New King James also covers the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Your body is not any more vile, according to Philippians 3.20, but just lowly. Huh. Well, the older you get, the more you see, this old flesh of mine can produce oh, nothing good. Amen. 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 Get worse all the time. Uh, the, the whole world lieth in wickedness. Mm -hmm. This whole present world is absolutely evil. Right. Only you think everything looks so shiny. The older you get, the more you see this world is absolutely uh, full of sin. But it says here in 1 John 5, 19, in New King James Bible, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Hmm. It's just uh, the, the wicked one, and he, it is his fault, the enemy is strong there. But uh, it's not me and the human beings. It's because we are just all made in the presence of the, the image of God anyway. You know? Luke 11, 4, the hmm. end of the prayer, Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil, it's a prayer. Change to deliver us from the evil one. Now, evil in general, not just the devil. There's all kind of evil, including evil from your own flesh. It's taken out in the New King James. Of course, you know, because the New the King James is archaic words you don't understand. Second Corinthians 1 12, rejoicing. You can rejoice in certain things, especially in suffering. Here you have to boast in certain things. There's a difference in boasting and rejoicing. See, the, the thing of yourself, boasting, yeah. uh, only a lonely body, the work always in the soul of the wicked one, delivers from the evil one. It makes the, the, the person self look good. You're not as bad as the Bible says we are. And that's the spirit of the pulpit in the last days. It is a spirit of humanistic pragmatism, look at me, and a refusal as a Christian to deny oneself, take up the cross, and just get a beating for Jesus Christ. And when you get any suffering, you go to rejoice that that spirit is completely gone among the Bible and preachers, as well as among the ministers and the churches here in England in the last days.
And uh, it has to do with starting with the book and then with the, the lack of preaching teaching from the King James Bible. All right, I want to leave it here. And um, I don't know how much time we've left here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's been going 40 minutes. 40 minutes? About 20, 25 minutes. Can I some questions? Yeah, if you have any questions here, uh, just open call for some questions. And I got a question. Raise your hand. I see your hand. Yeah. yeah um, you've had quite a lot of success in um, getting blokes saved in, over in Switzerland. And I, I don't mean to you know, take any glory away from the book, but we don't seem to reproduce that kind of success over here. I mean, if you look around, there's only as many guys as were here last time. Right. And you know, you've been saying all week that. The church has to be built by by you know by the men. Yeah. But what happens when you when there's a sort of lack of that? I mean, where do you go from there? Um, most of the time, in my experience, it can it can be different reasons. Uh, you have to be a little careful on these things. Um, it can be the um, uh, it can, it, first of all, it's not the Lord. And most of the time, it is that the uh, the people itself have to learn something. For instance, when I was in Switzerland, I was in Liechtenstein for a couple of years. Uh, I preached and taught the same stuff in the same way I preach now. I teach now. There's nothing different. Uh, of course, I had to learn some things myself, but the people I ministered to were, uh, was a church I never started, never founded, on a different Lutheran Bible with a different spirit. It was a spirit I didn't know that when I came there, they were drinking alcohol, they were smoking, and the women, all the women were running the man. So I preached my heart out for three years, and nothing changed much. And... Uh, that we kept on preaching and, and traveling around and then God opened the door in St. Gallen. And in St. Gallen I could start from scratch and lay the foundation in a couple of guys myself. Just from scratch, guys completely from the world, drug uh, addicts, uh, fornicators, uh, people in the world. And, and they got saved and I could lay the foundation on the right Bible with the right balance between uh, pure doctrine and practice and they started to grow and pick it up. So that might be a reason. Uh, I say a reason. Um, another thing is sometimes in James 1.22, uh, deceive not yourselves. Some of them have only been hearers of the word, not doers of the word. Uh, another thing can be when the foundation is good, uh, you get discouraged and you give up the fight. So uh, you do certain things, but Inwardly, you don't have any faith anymore that God can use you or help you to win a soul or build up something. That can be something. Discouragement. Inwardly discouragement. Giving up the, uh, the fight. Uh, throw the towel. Um, lack of faith, basically, in what God can do through His Word, through His Spirit. Um, I see, let's put it this way, in Western Europe, the last... Uh, I'll check it now. And the German-speaking area is the greatest language uh, group in, in Europe. I'm more than 100 million speaking German people. I, I checked now, uh, I came out eight years ago, I said, well, where is the material produced by Bible-believing missionaries in the Second World War? Because a lot of missionaries have been on There's hardly any Bible-believing material in Germany. Okay. What is the material, or what is the, where are the men, the nationals, Trained by Bible missionaries. Last 60 years. I'm the only one. So, another thing I sometimes see is um, when you start and you get the Word of God out and you sow the seed, God has to give the increase. But there's always something of uh, having a little further vision in getting doctrinal material out and training nationals. And what you have received, I think, is what Dickens has trained you 
to find, get a good foundation in the Word of God and learn to pursue, preach, and witness, and so on. And at the same time, it is you who have to do the work and pass it on. I always tell the guys in Switzerland, um, you are better soul winners as I am. You can better reach your own people than I, because I'm a Dutchman. You're a Swiss. And uh, if I'm not able to help you become good soul winners, and if you're not able to relate good to people in your own environment, and I'm not able to feed you, well, I fail. But in Liechtenstein, did the same thing, and I, nothing happened there because they refused to be doers of the word and only hearers of the word. So that's why I say it can be a mixture of things. Um, I don't know what it can be, uh, but the main thing is always to suit yourself in the line of God's word and say, Lord, uh, you show me what hinders me for the grace of God to be a, become a blessing for others. And sometimes, uh, when you're young, it's not always you win souls and start a ministry, but God many times has to work in you and at you before He can use you to become a blessing or a channel of blessing to others. Um, it's going to be the same thing there. I started as a 20 year old, got saved. So the student ministry there was responsible for the last five, six years, and eventually got getting saved there, went to America there, had to sort of all over again. After three years, went back to Liechtenstein, and so all over again. And then after three years, had to go to Switzerland, had to start all over again in the fourth country. That's not an encouraging thing. You start something, you tell me, okay, guy, you, you, you learned your lesson, now you go to the next thing. And I think by myself, well, I'm in 40 years of age, I'm not running circles all the time. But what it is, is the law is teaching you all kinds of things. And you grow, so you become a better minister. So it's not always the amount of physical fruit or souls, but also the inward growth in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, for me, that's hard to find out because I only see you a week. It's hard to say. But I know pretty much that you've been going through uh, the last years through a hard time. And it's one of you has to have some sufferings some dark failures with the Lord. And if you take it right, I hope so, you'll be rejoicing in that, and you become come out stronger and a better minister. And I don't know what, but I'm pretty much sure that uh, I've seen quite a lot of these ministries in Europe, small churches there, but you've got a couple of good guys over here. If you keep on plowing there, you would be, you should be become the guys for uh, uh, preaching and teaching the word of God to the English speaking people in the next 20, 30 years. You should do it. Good, good, good. So, well, I think, you know, listen, what you should be, I've got plenty of stuff. you got way more stuff than any uh, graduate after four to six years with an MA from Oxford or Cambridge University. So God has given you much, it will require much of you, but he gets you time to sit and learn, apply it, and then finally, when you learn your lesson, be a better minister to us. But you're better ministers by nature, because you're English, and what the difference is, and people in Switzerland are better ministers to their own people, as I am as a Dutchman from outside. I get more honor because a prophet is never only in his own country. So I get more honor there, and they don't, but they are more effective in Switzerland. So it's a kind of, uh, uh, I, I cannot say uh, why certain things don't come to pass. Or not, come to pass, uh, you have to ask the Lord about it and yourself about it, but the main thing is you make sure you learn your lesson and pass the tests and the, and the testings God's given you and God will make sure that in due time uh, He'll use you to be a blessing to others. Amen. That's the only thing I can say about that. Well, that's any other questions? Uh, was it just the NIV or was it all the new versions that omitted the word man 861 times? The word what? Man. Man. It, it was the NIV specifically. But if you take the other versions, I would guess over a thousand times the same thing. Yeah. And what word was it that made the Jews flip out? Was because they believe that Jesus was the Son of God? Or? Which word can you say it again? Well, it made the, the Jews flip out. Only so was it. Uh, oh, it was uh, in X, uh, two and X three. <coughs> the, the word that holy child Jesus. 
uh, holy child means holy son, and a Jew believes not that God has a son as an individual man, that's blasphemy, only the Messiah will be there, uh, but only um, a, uh, uh, this was a nation is called the Son of God. Yes, right. Does a, does a man that has not been called to preach have any place in the pulpit? Uh, he can... Uh, I, I say this because the, the pastor's going to go on, you know, to, the, to the Bible school, uh, to the, the pastor's conference, mm -hmm. uh, and I volunteer to preach for, you know, it's only for one Sunday, right. but I haven't been called to preach. I've got a message that I think the Lord's given me, mm -hmm. but I can't say like he can, or you can, that the Lord's ever called me to preach. So should I really be in the pulpit at all? Right. Well, for instance, like myself, uh, called to preach, not called to preach. Uh, I got saved. I want to witness. I want to help the guys who got saved. I went to PBI. I, I want to learn Greek, Hebrew, and Manchester Demons. When I was a preacher school, I loved to preach in the street. did everything I could to preach uh, a couple of times a week outside of Pensacola. And then God got me a chance to become a, a pastor. And if I wanted to become a pastor, to it anyway. I never thought much about my call to preach. I just did it. <laughs> Whenever it was an opportunity, I had peace about the whole thing there. And really, I never uh, heard about being called to preach until I came to PBI. So the call to preach, uh, I don't know, it's between individual thing between you and the Lord. If you believe God uh, wants you to, uh, for instance, uh, you get a request from the pastor, can you fill in the book? You pray about it. You get an answer. I, 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 I volunteer, so. All right, the volunteers are here on ISMD. That's what Desire said too. Well, if you do, and, and, and do what God wants you to do, to serve Him, there are a couple of things which you can find out if that's something which is a blessing to others. You can joy in it, uh, obviously get a blessing out of it, or they see something in it which is a help for you, um, or they get help themselves. And these are all outward things where you can say, if I do it, and Bob has got a blessing out of it, it's like we're doing the dishes here or something else, well, then do it. And especially when your pastor asks you to do it, and he says there's nothing against it when you volunteer, I'll take it. Yeah, but I won't be a little, a little careful about these specific calls to preach, because I've seen a lot of guys there, oh, I'm called to preach, you know, and I'd rather preach than eat. And ten years later, he has what they're doing now. Eating. 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 I think Africa, from South Africa. He came back to England in the 19th century and visited the churches you now to get the uh, funds and people. And when he was set up to preach in the church like this, with three old ladies, you know, and all and playing, you know, he was doing a story, you know, about the need of a man who come to the dark woods of Africa, preaching the word of God to the, uh, the savages and the heathen there. And then the end said, well, anybody there who uh, wants to volunteer? With these ladies, you know, and oh, man, oh, we pray for you, preacher. And then the workers are going, oh, and then the meeting. <laughs> and at the end of the meeting, a little boy slips out beside the organ and comes and says, uh, It's already playing. I like uh, the Livingston. I like to you know, be, uh, come and help the guys there. And when God was in the guy, said, Okay, okay, kid, you know, go to medical college. He went, he found him up in Africa, and his name was David Livingston. Right. He's got called to preach, and the medical doctor told him that. So, you know, the, the thing I, I think is uh, you're in a church. You do what you can. You have the Christian Union stuff. You see God blesses them. Uh, you volunteer. You do it. And uh, your pastor, most of the time, sees things in you you don't see. Especially when you're in some kind of battle or some kind of race, you know, and you don't see certain things, but your pastor sees them. When I went to PBI, uh, I came there and I wanted to learn Greek Hebrew ministry words, and I thought I would become, uh, should become a street preacher and take Europe for Christ. And, and um, Came back in 2000. Uh, no, in 1999 went through, we came over here with you being in, in Jimmy Hood. Mm -hmm. And then we came through Austria, and there was a missionary who needed to pass for a church in Liechtenstein. And I met him, and I met him only two days, and he came to 
PBI 1999. I thought Dr. Rock knew about it. Dr. Rock came through there. I talked about uh, the need for a pastor, and they both said, thought I was the ideal person. I never wanted to be a pastor. I hated pastoring. I hated a pastor or a, uh, a reverend. Uh, I remember my, my grandmother telling me, you should become a reverend because you can learn. I said, no, I'm become a professional soccer player. I despise pastors. And Dr. Rockman saw something different already. And in 2003, I came back, and he gave me a PhD for some kind of work as a teaching degree. I don't like teaching at all. But the old man sees something I never saw. But your pastor probably sees something you don't see. So when there's a chance, he said, why don't you do it? And he doesn't say anything, just do it. But a lot of times, the old, the old, the old the guard sees different things in a young man than a young man sees himself. And the best is to be faithful to what God gives you to do. And he will seem fit and to put you in place at the same time. After you do a whole lot of things in a local church, he says, that's something which is good for you, which is a blessing for you. But it's the kind of attitude you just develop as a servant in a small church. is a great privilege, which you don't have in a big church. You do all kinds of stuff, especially when you're not going on a furlough, for instance. You can do all kinds of stuff in a local church, and later on you'll be thankful. Now we say, man, I do this and this and this and this. It's good for you, Carol. Yes, Alan, you have a question. Uh, 